Hey, good morning to everybody. Welcome to the uh, Summer School of the Austrian uh, Central Bank, the Österreichische Nationalbank. Um, I don't know whether you see me. What I see right now is only our screen. Okay, so you see me. Fine. Um, yeah, my name is Andreas Beitenfelder. I'm in the uh, boss in the economics department of the uh, Research National Bank, more exactly in the foreign research division. And here next to me sits uh, Wolfgang Pointner, uh, who together with me has prepared this uh, summer school. Um, it's a special summer school. It's one in a very special format because of the current uh, health crisis. Uh, but it's also special because uh, the content, um, um, the, the subject, uh, does not really allow to have a single presenter, as we usually would have at the summer school, but instead to have a couple of presenters here, a couple of lecturers, because this uh, field of uh, Climate economics is quite diverse. Uh, we have here about around 50, uh, almost 50 participants, uh, predominantly, of course, from central banks, but not only, with quite different backgrounds, most of them economists, but not everybody, as I suppose. Uh, the majority comes from uh, our department, the, uh, the economics department, but uh, also quite half of, of, of our Austrian Pacific participants from other departments. And then we have uh, another uh, some 15 or so participants from other central banks. Very warm welcome to everybody. Um, okay, so let's enter into the subject. Um, and as an advertiser, I just thought to to show you this uh, particular slide because it's, um, it's it, it links it to the to the current topical issue, the the current health crisis, and our subject. And uh, the the International uh, Energy Agency um, announced a, a couple of weeks ago that um, the the crisis had a kind of positive impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So we have now a, up, up, until the end of the year, we will have an, a reduction of some 8% of these emissions. So this looks like good news. Uh, but on the other hand, we should be aware that this was, of course, it's huge economic costs, more or less it's a similar amount, it's a similar uh, size, magnitude. And that is uh, also, if you, if you take, for example, the, um, the recent, most recent forecast of the uh, International Monetary Fund, there, uh, the current projections are uh, for global economic growth, growth in, in the, on the break and so forth, um, with uh, around 5% of slump of decline, and uh, compared to the increase of last year, 3%, if you put this together, then you have also a similar magnitude of 8% of, uh, of um, loss in terms of economic growth. So we see uh, if we really want to, to enter into a kind of degrowth uh, strategy to get rid of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, this would be extremely cost, costly and finally we would end up possibly somewhere at uh, no single uh, uh, euro or, or dollar of, uh, of uh, global GDP. So that, that wouldn't make sense. So we need to find strategies to, to reconcile growth and, uh, and uh, uh, the transition to a low carbon economy. Um, yeah, and I think basically about ways to, 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 to manage this, all these uh, summer schools should be about. 
Um, let me just uh, introduce now the uh, lectures. Um, now we start with uh, Emanuele Campillo, and please excuse me if I pronounce the names not correctly. He's currently at the University of Bologna, and he will just start with a, uh, with a kind of introduction to the whole subject, uh, introducing to all the economic um, theory thinking on, on climate change. Uh, in the next session, we will have Kevin Riai. Uh, he will um, he is from the International Institute of Applied Systems and Analysis uh, in Luxembourg, in Austria, and at the same time at the Technical University in Graz. And he will uh, introduce to the particular to the integrated assessment modeling as it is used by the IPCC, the International Panel of Climate, what is it? Um, Intergovernmental uh, Climate Change. Yeah. <clears throat> now, um, and he will also, and he has also uh, worked, by the way, uh, in a uh, in a project of the so-called network of central banks and supervisors for greening of the financial system in preparing uh, uh, scenarios for uh, climate uh, risks. Now, the next, by the way, uh, when I started to think about this uh, whole program, I, I, I called another quite um, famous uh, climate economist. Uh, his name is um, uh, Dietz at the, at the London School of Economics, and he told me that he has no time for, 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 for this uh, event, but he suggested to ask some of the uh, quite uh, uh, well-known uh, um, economists working in Austria on these issues, and we have here a collection of, 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 the, of them. So Emanuele worked in, in Austria until, yes, worked until now here, uh, Riai is still working here, and we have then a, a third one here, but then we can come back to, to that in, in half a minute. So the next uh, speaker tomorrow, tomorrow morning will be Paola uh, Dorazio from uh, Ruhr University Bochum, and she will concentrate on agent-based models um, in, in climate economics. The next will be Sandra Batten from the Bank of England. She was one of the pioneers in, uh, in writing of, on uh, climate change issues from the perspective of central banks. Uh, together, by the way, with our next speaker, Warwick J. McKibben from the Austrian, uh, Australian National University. Uh, he uh, was also the first one who wrote on monetary policy regimes in particular in the view of climate change. Now I, uh, I come to the third uh, in Austria situated uh, economist Irene Monestarolo. Uh, she is at the Vienna uh, University of the Economy and also at the Boston University. She uh, we'll speak about uh, climate financial risk assessment on the economy and, and, uh, uh, and finance. So by the way, um, usually the whole issue nowadays is mainly dealt from the financial risk perspective. We tried in this course a bit to shift the perspective towards uh, monetary policy issues. Monetary policy issues in terms of climate change have been uh, discussed uh, or have been discussed prior to the crisis already. I remember a, a speech of Likanen, for example, but also the, uh, the Central Bank of Indonesia, for example, organized a conference on climate change and central banking at that time. You remember it was the time of high energy prices 
of inflation and and already there uh, the, the, the worries about the the links to climate between climate and and and, and, uh, and central banking arose. But then came the financial crisis, and all the, the issues get got completely overshadowed, and we completely forgot it. Even we individually uh, had to deal with the crisis all the time. And only in 2015, the whole issue started again with the famous uh, speech of uh, Mark Carney um, on the um, so-called um, tragedy of horizon, if you remember. Now, but this was an, it was basically introducing into the financial aspects of the issue. Now we try to a bit come back to the to the monetary policy issues as well. Our seventh uh, presenter will be another Austrian, and this time a real Austrian, not only living in Austria but also I guess he's national. Uh, at University of Graz, at the, at the Wegener Center for Climate and Global Change, comparable to the Grantham Center or the Potsdam Center, and that's our Austrian um, uh, Center on, on, on Climate Change, and he will try to put the whole debate in, in an Austrian context. Finally, we, have, we will have a panel debate uh, with uh, some uh, very high profile um, um, representatives chaired by our head of the department, uh, Doris Litzberger Grünwald. Uh, in the panel, there will be Francesco Trudi from uh, the ECB. He's actually dealing uh, with the um, strategic review uh, work on monetary policy and climate change. So he is possibly very well uh, situated to tell us about the progress in this process. Uh, then we will have Pierre-François Weber from uh, the Banque de France. He is um, the head of a substream within a work stream of the network of, for greening of the financial system. Um, this, uh, the central bank network, as I already uh, told you. And they have already produced the first, uh, what they call the first takeaway on the issues of monetary policy and climate change. Now, finally, we have uh, again Sandra Betten in this panel because she, as I told you, is one of the pioneers in writing on these issues. So that's the program for today and the next four days. Let me finish with a short acknowledgement. I have to say that I'm very grateful to uh, Amon Rezai, who helped uh, us in preparing this uh, summer school. Unfortunately, he doesn't have time to present himself, but uh, he helped us very much in uh, reflecting on, on our plans. And of course, uh, the usual disclaimer applies here too. So now, I have just to introduce again to our next speaker and to our uh, first lecturer, <laughs> that is Emanuele Campillo, now associate professor at the University of Bologna, uh, also visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science, the LSE, and the affiliate scientist at the European Institute of Economic and Environment. Previously, he was an assistant professor at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Uh, of course, he is very specialized on the research link between climate change, macro financial systems, and sustainable transition. And possibly also very important, he is a recipient of a five year uh, European Research Council starting grant, the so called ERC, congratulations to this, it's very one of the highest ranked um, uh, research programs. And also, he was also, prior to this, uh, uh, a principal researcher in other programs called Cascade and Window, and uh, now on Smooth is still there. So, Emanuele, we are very happy to have you here, and I know you 
you have a lot to say, so I, without not any ado, I give the floor to you. Okay. You can, you can simply. Think, I think it should be no problem. I'm not uh, having the power anymore. <clears throat> Right, so now you should be able to see my screen, correct? Yes, yes, we do. Perfect. So uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and, uh, and for being here. Um, your pronunciation was um, excellent, thank you. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm still actually um, part of the Vienna University of Economics and Business for one more week, and then I will, will start the the University of Bologna on the 1st of September. Uh, so it's, I'm very glad to be still in contact with um, the Austrian environment. Um, the organizers uh, gave me the honor and also the burden of being the first one uh, to go uh, in uh, a week of lectures. So um, instead of presenting uh, what I'm doing and focusing just on that, what, what, I, what I try to do is to uh, offer you an overview, uh, my overview, uh, of what the topics, uh, authors, problems, um, research strategies are uh, at the moment in the field of uh, climate macroeconomics, let's call it, uh, climate macroeconomics and, and finance. Um, so what I will do is uh, I, I will I will I prepared um, uh, an overview and then whenever appropriate I will slip in um, uh, references to to my own research so you can also uh, see what I'm what I'm working on. Right. So uh, let me start immediately because as Andreas said I actually have a quite packed set of slides. Um, what I will do is the following. So I, I will start by um, uh, discussing what the uh, underlying social objectives are here. And of course, there are many societal objectives that we compose ourselves as human societies. But in this case, I will uh, um, focus on the desire of achieving a rapid and smooth uh, transition to low carbon technologies. So maybe you will notice already that uh, I didn't uh, include climate impacts, so that the link between climate impacts and, and macroeconomics and finance, um, just for a matter of, of time. And uh, this is the uh, topic that I that I know better, so I will I will stick to this. And then uh, defining the social objectives will will help me to define also. Uh, what do we need to understand? So what are the research, once we, we, we identify what we want to achieve, uh, what is it that we need to understand in order to uh, be able to achieve these objectives? And so I will uh, um, uh, identify four main sets of research questions and uh, I will present them, present them to you. Finally, uh, I will try to um, understand, I will try to answer to this question, how can, can we understand all of this? So once we have identified this, you will see multiple and evolving research questions. What is it that we need to do in order to answer these questions? And um, there are different methodologies, uh, different approaches to answering these questions. I will give you a taste of what I believe are the main pillars, methodological pillars. But then I will also focus um, more specifically on dynamic macroeconomic modeling. And uh, this hopefully fits with the rest of the course as well, uh, because you will hear from uh, um, experts in, for instance, uh, some of these uh, methodological options. So ideally, this will provide you with, uh, with an overview of what the modeling methodological choices uh, are and can be. Okay, so what are the objectives? This is, I guess, the easiest part um, because, uh, you know, I didn't know exactly uh, the, the, the level of previous expertise on this. Uh, of course, I, I, I guess that um, uh, central, banks, central bank officials um, are not necessarily trained in climate change economics, but uh, I will be brief because I, I feel that anyway now this is relatively common knowledge. So. The first objective here is a rapid low carbon transition. Uh, the reason is, is the risk of uh, climate change and, and climate impacts on societies and, and economies. 
and uh, uh, climatic ch climate stability is put at threat, um, is put at risk by the emissions of greenhouse gas uh, gases. And uh, so the policy objective here, that is an international policy objective uh, agreed upon, for instance, in, in Paris um, a few years back, is to keep the temperatures below two degrees or hopefully 1.5 degrees. So in order to achieve that, we need to decarbonize the economic system. We need to reduce the uh, amount of emissions. And in order to do that, we need to uh, develop new technologies and we need to deploy them uh, at a mass scale. In order to be able to do this, uh, we essentially need to reallocate the financial resources and productive resources, let's call them, um, away from high carbon sectors and towards uh, low carbon activities and technologies. I think it's important to, to distinguish uh, because they're often conflated and this um, uh, leads to misunderstanding. It's, it's useful to distinguish between physical and financial investments. So we, we need both. We need physical investments that is uh, non-financial firms um, purchasing uh, uh, pieces of technologies or capital stock or machinery or, or building infrastructure that is low carbon. And of course, you also need non-financial firms developing these low carbon capital stocks. And this is on one side. And then on the other, you, you also need financial investments. So you need financial institutions, so banks and institutional investors and asset managers and whatnot, they, they need to uh, reallocate their financial portfolios towards these uh, low carbon uh, firms. So this is the first societal objective. The second is um, uh, this. It's, it's, so we need a rapid low carbon transition, but we also need a smooth low carbon transition. And this might be difficult to achieve um, because decarbonizing the economic system means a deep structural change uh, in, uh, the, um, in, in, in the productive network. Uh, most uh, productive sectors, they depend on fossil fuels as, uh, um, in, as an intermediate input. And then you have a bunch of other productive sectors that create a lot of value added that depend on this uh, intermediate sectors that rely on fossil fuels for their intermediate inputs. So ultimately, the whole economic system lies on a bed, on a rock of fossil fuels. Uh, this is a paper that I published um, uh, with some co-authors last year, no, this year, sorry, um, where we, we essentially um, uh, use network analysis uh, in order to show how um, there, is a, um, uh, there are different layers in the economy uh, of dependence of sectors depending on, on, on each other. These, these links that you see here, it's, just, it's essentially a representation of forward linkages. And we show how ultimately the material inputs coming from this B sector, which would be the mining sector, are uh, essential. Um, this is the, the, the old idea by Herman Daly of, an inver of the economic system as an inverted pyramid. And we, we show it using uh, this network visualization. This is the case for Germany, right? So uh, the, the mining sector provides crucial intermediate inputs to a bunch of sectors. This is mainly uh, manufacturing and, and electricity and constructions, and they provide crucial inputs to other sectors. And then you go downstream, essentially, uh, here at the top, um, you have the services uh, sector. And uh, to decarbonize all of this is very tricky because uh, uh, in many instances, we don't have the technologies yet. So in some cases, we have promising advances like in electricity, if you think about renewable energy, but in other sectors, we are lagging behind. Think about manufacturing, cement, steel, aluminum, um, chemicals, uh, or think about international transport like shipping and aviation. In this case, the technologies are, the, the low carbon alternatives are still not competitive with the high carbon incumbents. And so moving away from these incumbents might create large disruptions, right? And um, we, don't, we don't know for sure. There is the concern that this might be the case. And so we uh, insert uh, this as, as an additional feature of the low carbon transition that we want. Rapidity and smoothness.
So this helps me uh, in uh, identifying uh, um, uh, four big blocks of research questions in the field. Right? So you have, uh, for instance, rapidity in the first column, you have smoothness in the, in the second column, and then for each of these dimensions, you can uh, distinguish between, between obstacles uh, and, and solutions. So for instance, um, if you start with the rapidity column, one first big set of questions are related to the question, what are the obstacles to expanding physical and financial low carbon investments? What is in the way of this happening? And then once we understand what, what's in the way, we can also try to ask ourselves, how can we overcome these, uh, um, these obstacles? What are, what are the policies? What are the institutions? What are the behaviors that we need to enact in order to overcome these obstacles? So you see they're, they're very li strongly linked as, as research questions, but I, I think it's useful to, to distinguish them because in order to be able to come up with solutions, we first need to clearly understand what the problems are. And the same you can apply to the smoothness uh, column. So on one side, uh, we can ask ourselves, what are the drivers and transmission channels of potential disruptions along the low carbon transition and triggered by the low carbon transition? And on the solution side, then we can ask ourselves, how do we mitigate these risks? Once we identify where the problems might come from, then we can also um, uh, try to uh, come up with, with, policy, with policy packages in order to mitigate these risks and adapt to these risks as well, adapt to the impact. Right, so let me go a bit uh, deeper into each of these uh, questions now, because then within each category, you have uh, you know, a number of, of entire fields of research. So let's start with the obstacles to low carbon investments. Um, so th there's, a, there's a, a number of, of factors that concur in putting obstacles to uh, firms, both non-financial and financial firms, in their possible desires uh, to, to go low carbon. So the, the first one is quite obvious, I would say, is that, um, as I was saying before, uh, many low carbon uh, technologies are still not uh, developed enough or competitive in, enough with respect to the high carbon um, option uh, to attract, attract attention, or they're perceived as excessively risky. Um, even when uh, there is um, a competitive low carbon option, and again here think about electricity production, um, there are a number of uh, locking factors that still might prevent um, firms to go there. And this is a, a web of, of inertia factors and, and lock-ins that are basically engaging the system into the high carbon incumbent uh, technological options. So some, some lock-ins are, are technical. Think about, for instance, the uh, network of, of gas stations that uh, give an incentive uh, to, to, to go for combustion engines rather than electric vehicles. Um, some of uh, the lock-in factors are cognitive. Uh, so human beings, they, they tend to stick with what they know, uh, they, they work in, in routines, they imitate others, and so this also might uh, prevent them to go into an, un an unknown field. There are some financial lock-ins which are particularly powerful in that um, there are firms, and, and financial firms in particular, that have already um, invested large amounts of money into high carbon companies, assets, technologies, and it might be, it might be difficult to divest. Divest only comes with some costs. And so they are also not happy of, of a, a rapid low carbon transition. And then of course, there are some political uh, lock-ins and, and you know you have plenty of example think think uh, about uh, every time any government try to implement a phase out of fossil fuel subsidies um uh, lay, lay very recently in indonesia again and in france uh, last year with the yellow vests so this becomes um uh, a nightmare uh, for policymakers so they are not really they don't really have the incentive to go there 
Uh, and a third set of, uh, of uh, questions related to the obstacles to low carbon investments has to do with uncertainty. So there is uh, limited uncertainty about the present, so um, uh, an imperfect information set regarding the technological options that uh, can, can and, and needs to be addressed. And then, of course, there is the uh, unavoidable uncertainty about uh, what happens into the future. Um, many of these technologies might make sense from an economical perspective only if there are some mitigation policies being implemented, like a carbon price, for instance, uh, but uh, we don't know whether they're going to be um, uh, actually implemented, and um, human beings, they work uh, with some planning horizons that, especially in certain sectors, Sectors like the financial system tend to be very short term, and this, of course, uh, might um, uh, prevent them to invest low carbon, right? Because I might expect a policy coming in in the future, but anyway, it's beyond what I care about, right? Um, think about asset managers that need to report, you know, on a quarterly basis or on a, on a yearly basis uh, their returns, uh, even if uh, uh, things might. Uh, change in the near future, this will be at some point beyond their planning horizon. So this is a whole other uh, set of questions that, that we need to address. And ultimately, uh, this links to an, a bigger underlying question that is uh, a, a really like an entire field in economics, which is how do people invest? How do asset managers decide uh, uh, what to invest in? And in particular, what is the role of the human dimension in their investment decisions, their, their emotions, their sentiments, their expectations about the future, the biases that they have as human beings. So this is just one set of questions related to how, uh, what are the obstacles that we can identify in how people invest uh, that prevent low carbon investments. Uh, then we can ask ourselves, what do we do about it? And of course, here there is one king solution, king answer, which is let's put a price on carbon. Um, so let's put a price on the carbon content of um, goods and services. Let's internalize the environmental externality, and this will shift behaviors uh, accordingly. Um, I think there is no debate, or not that I'm aware of, meaning there is absolute consensus in economics about the necessity of implementing a carbon price. Um, the question is here rather, is it going to be sufficient? Or if you want to reframe it, um, is a politically feasible carbon price sufficient to trigger low carbon investments in the amounts that is needed to achieve a two degrees and, and so on? And uh, there are uh, some, some good reasons to think that uh, it might not. Uh, I, um, I put here a link to, to a paper of mine uh, from 2016, uh, but I'm not the only one making this case that there are additional market failures. And, uh, you know, the, the old adage in economics is one policy for each market failure, and we can identify multiple mar market failures in, in uh, uh, financial markets and, and credit markets that might require additional policies. So the question becomes, what policies, what, what, is, what are the, the, the tools um, that we can use? Um, and here I'm just listing without any real uh, judgment at the moment. Uh, so, of course, there are disclosure requirements that um, you probably know very much uh, about already. Um, so here we're talking about asking uh, uh, firms to, to disclose uh, there, for instance, exposure, exposure to climate risks so that investors might take an informed choice and if they want to invest low carbon, then they, they can. They, they, they can invest low carbon because they know what, what is low carbon uh, or what is climate resilient. But uh, one could also argue to, to go um, uh, further than that. For instance, using, using policies, I, I call them here prudential policies, but this is not entirely correct, meaning they are prudential policies that, that are used, that can be used for promotional purposes, right? So there are some instances, instances in some emerging economies of using uh, differentiated reserve requirements. Um, one could also argue for differentiated, differentiated capital requirements, which might, should be used uh, 
to look at risk, but can be also be used to influence um, uh, um, uh, lo lo investments, for instance, by, by banks. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about monetary policies, for instance, how to use quantitative easing, uh, these this new monetary, pol monetary policy tools that we have uh, in order to stimulate uh, low carbon investments. And then there is also this uh, big chapter of old good uh, public spending, so the government um, uh, spending money in public infrastructure that support low carbon technologies or uh, development banks. Uh, so this is still an arm of the government, but it's, it works in different ways. But anyway, development banks lending to low carbon firms or um, uh, local authorities wanting to, be, to, to make their territories uh, low carbon. You can already feel probably how this is then raising an, a, an immediate question, further question, which is which institutions are supposed to do that, right? So prudential policies, monetary policies, it's not like we can ask the government to, to implement a green quantitative easing. So this leads to a whole set of questions about uh, political economy, even political science, if you want, that is, um, what is the role uh, of, of other institutions like central banks and financial supervisors uh, that are traditionally not linked to climate change or um, any direction that the economic uh, structure might take? Um, can we ask central banks to adopt promotional measures? Um, should we be able to ask central banks to adopt promotional measures? So this, you know, leads to a number of of, uh, of uh, possible positions and and things to to discuss, and there is a florid literature and discussion on this. Okay, so then third uh, set of questions: uh, sources of transition disruptions. So now we're we we move to the smoothness column, and here we're trying to ask uh, what could go what could go wrong. Suppose that we we managed to find the solutions to all the questions that, that I just discussed. Um, is, it, is it going to be fine? Well, um, there are good reasons to think that um, the transition might have some uh, economic, financial, and social costs. And so as researchers, an interesting question to try to answer is, yeah, but, 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 but where? Uh, how does this disruption originate and how it is transmitted to the rest of the economy? So Mark Carney, who was already mentioned by Andreas, who um, is, is a sort of leading figure in this discussion in, in, in recent years, um, he was, for instance, uh, uh, discussing this, this idea of a climate Minsky moment. Right, so uh, financial instability and economic recession that that is that is triggered by by climate change by a combination of, of climate impacts and and uh, uh, late transitions. Um, but we don't know much about this climate Minsky moment. We know something about a Minsky moment, but not really about a climate Minsky moment because it never happened. And so it's really like an exploration into into the future. So one thing that, that uh, uh, is being discussed even by NGFS and all central banks is what, what, are, what could be the drivers uh, of disruptions along the transition. So usually the, 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 the three main things that are mentioned are um, an implementation of policies or a, a quicker than expected technological development or a sudden shift of preferences for instance, think about Fridays for the future, having a, a huge impact in the world. And um, the way that things are framed is, I, I put here just a, a couple of, of things that are there in the air, but one could, could um, use different terms. But essentially the idea is that if we wait too much, then there will be a moment, possibly triggered by some climate event, there will be a moment in which uh, an abrupt transition uh, will uh, come about. Uh, so what we want instead is a gradual, smooth transition, and we want to avoid a sudden, an unexpected, an abrupt, a, a disruptive transition. 
where, for instance, there is a climate event, as I, as I was saying, and then this triggers an inevitable policy response. So this is a, a narrative that, that is being uh, um, discussed. Once the triggers um, trigger, uh, then how do th things, uh, how, how, do this, um, how are these impacts transmitted to the rest of the economy? And here, usually, uh, the narrative is about asset stranding. Um, you're probably already familiar with this. The, the idea is that um, there are certain assets that might lose um, parts of their monetary value because of climate impacts or because of a, of a transition to a low carbon uh, society. The, the root of everything is in the material stuff. Is it's, in, it's in fossil fuels, right? So if we want to uh, keep the temperatures below two degrees, then some of the reserves that are there, they exist and they are and they are economically viable to extract, they need to remain in the ground. And this creates two issues. They lose value and they, um, uh, we will need to deal with the fact that uh, production of fossil fuels and thus consumption of fossil fuels will decline. And this creates two other forms of stranding, which is physical stranding of capital assets. So capital stocks that are designed to fit with fossil fuel use becoming unutilized uh, or uh, having to be reconverted with a cost um, or uh, financial assets, um, financial assets stranding. So a loss of value of financial assets. And if you're interested um, here, I, I co-authored a, a review um, of the available literature on, the, on, on how both climate and, and the transition might trigger uh, uh, a revaluation of asset prices uh, together with some co-authors uh, here at this link. And uh, then transmission channels, they, they, they hit society, they hit the economic system, and then uh, we can then have this aggregate, larger, wider macroeconomic impacts that lead to this uh, famous climate Minsky mo uh, moment. Uh, let me give you a couple of tastes of, of uh, my uh, current research on, on similar topics. Uh, so for instance, this is um, a paper, uh, a couple of papers actually now that I've been working on um, here for a couple of years that, uh, that, that look at uh, the stranding of physical assets in the form of loss of capacity utilization uh, of capital stocks in different sectors and different countries uh, due to a reduction of fossil fuel inputs. And I don't, I don't have time, unfortunately, to go into the details, of course, but uh, you can see how essentially it's a, it's a very in, um, uh, interlinked web of stranding risks from um, uh, one country to the other and one sector to the other. So this is, for instance, what happens in terms of stranding if you have a unitary reduction of fossil fuel production in the mining sectors of all these, of all these countries. Uh, here we focus uh, just to show how it cascades down. We focus on the Australian uh, mining sector and we show how this creates stranding uh, in other countries. For instance, the Japanese electricity sector, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese also coke uh, uh, industry, and then this trickles down, this stranding impact trickles down to other domestic sectors. So there's a lot of things to, to say here in, 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 this, in this part that are still being developed. That's, that's my point. So this is still in the phase of let's try to answer a research question that has really not, never been, been tackled. Um, and this is another paper uh, on transition risks um, uh, that is coming out uh, soon on, on wires climate change, uh, co-authored by, uh, by me and, and others, where we essentially try to um, make a comprehensive, create a comprehensive framework of what transition risks mean, um, how they could originate, how they could be transmitted to the rest of the economy. And so, for instance, this is our, let's say, main figure, uh, right? So you have these transition risk drivers uh, that might um, um, uh, trigger for any reason, and this uh, creates economic costs uh, in non-financial firms in the, firm, in the form, for instance, of physical 
stranding, unemployment, loss of revenues. Uh, this is then uh, um, transmitted to financial, uh, the financial system. You, you see here you have different types of, of actors in the financial system that are affected in, in different ways. And we discussed this in the paper. And then a combination of all these um, uh, impacts then leads to wider macroeconomic impacts of different form. And they are all interlinked and evolving, right? So here, companies are affected as, as, as well, again, uh, but households are affected as well, and, and the government, and then these macroeconomic impacts, of course, they have feedback effects back to the transition drivers. So it's a, it's a sort of evolving uh, uh, system, a very complex one, that we still need to uh, understand in full. Okay, so finally, uh, the, the fourth um, uh, quadrant, so the, 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 four, the fourth uh, bit in the, um, in the matrix that I was showing to you uh, has to do with uh, policies to mitigate transition risks. So here, the, the main thing that is being discussed, of course, um, as you probably know already, is uh, asking uh, uh, firms to uh, apply some uh, risk, some enhanced risk assessment methodology to their uh, portfolios or their business operations and then disclose uh, these results to the rest of the economic system so that others could uh, react to it. For instance, uh, um, uh, financial investors might decide to divest from a firm that is heavily exposed to some kind of climate-related uh, risk. Uh, methodologies are still in development and um, uh, one question here that is also being uh, addressed is, is, is a final methodology even achievable? Um, that, is, that is yet to be seen, meaning you can, you can come up with some methodologies, but um, is there ever going to be a reliable uh, methodology to assess this type of risks, given all the problems in the field, the, the lack of data, uh, the lack of certainty, and so on? Uh, that everybody agrees on and central banks accept and financial supervisors accept and firms accept. Um, there is a recent paper that I was just uh, seeing the other day by uh, Josh Ryan Collins at UCL and, and some co-authors that, for instance, is arguing uh, that there's no time. There's no time for this. And they're invoking a precautionary principle approach in order to push um, uh, financial supervisors and central banks to already take into consideration uh, these uh, risks, even if they're not clearly and finally assessed, because this might never happen. Uh, what uh, policies, what additional policies can be, can be um, thought of? Uh, of course, here is the, the, the main point is take these this risks, because we're talking about transition risks, take these risks, calculate them if possible, as I said, and then uh, use them to calibrate uh, prudential policies. There is still, the issue that I was mentioning of whether this then goes beyond the borders of prudential policies and, and goes into the promotional sphere of action, which might pose institutional and governance issues that we need to discuss. Um, the, the, and of course, this involves also, again, which institutions are there, because financial stability by climate and, and, um, and um, uh, uh, transition, uh, the, the low carbon transition has been the entry point for climate change, for central banks and financial supervisors to, to talk about this. But what we might want to avoid is central banks uh, really implementing promotional measures by stealth, by not saying it, right? So we, we do care about financial stability, yes, of course, but we, 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 we also know that prudential policies might have promotional implications, so we need to discuss this. And uh, of course, luckily, this is a very uh, lively field of discussion. I, I put here uh, a link to an article by um, me and some co-authors um, uh, on nature climate change on, uh, in 2018, but um, in a way, this is already quite also even outdated because uh, in, the, in the meantime, uh, uh, new relevant contributions built on, on this um, and uh, they advance the discussion. For instance, the, the Greens One uh, report that you're probably uh, aware of. 
And then uh, I won't get into this, but of course, there is also the whole question of how do we adapt to the transition? For instance, what are the implications for monetary policy if there is a, a, a transition and then and thus a change in relative prices of energy goods, right? So this is something that uh, I, I, um, I feel maybe uh, McKibben might, might touch upon, so I will, I will leave it there. Okay, so how do we understand all of this? Um, uh, I, I hope I, I conveyed the message that this is a field with a lot of unanswered questions at the moment. And um, what I tried to do for this lecture is to come up with a, a wish list of methodological features that any framework, I, I have in mind modeling, but you can apply to, to any framework um, uh, that you might, you, you might want to use to address these questions. Uh, what does it have to have? What are the features that, features that we need, right? Given all these problems that, and all these research questions that are highlighted. So <clears throat> I came up with this list. I don't know how comprehensive it is, and I'm, I'm happy to, to hear your opinion on, it, on this. So, uh, we, we need, of course, a representation of, of multiple technologies. This is something that you, you already have in, in uh, integrated assessment models and CGE models and, and, and others, um, uh, but not everywhere, right? Especially not in the, in the macroeconomic uh, modeling field. Um, the, uh, the granularity uh, depends on your research question. At the minimum, you need two types of technologies, right? A high carbon and a low carbon and uh, you uh, want to distinguish them for their emission intensity, but also for their economical uh, features, their, their price, their productivity, um, their, uh, their, uh, the lifetime of the asset, and, and so on. You need a representation of physical assets, because otherwise you wouldn't understand physical stranding, but that's not enough to, to, to look at physical stranding. You also need to be able to have uh, assets that are um, not fully utilized, which is not the standard in, uh, in economic modeling. So you have the K, the, the capital stock, and that's just utilized because we usually have a supply-driven approach whereby K is just utilized to, to, to produce. Um, but um, this might not be the case in a transition. You might have physical capital stocks that are underutilized, and we, you, we need to be able to, to represent that, and not, not only that, we need to also take into account the fact that physical capital stocks, they, are, they were built in different stages, right? The, the, the capital stock operating now, maybe it was built 30 years ago, and in the meantime, there was technological development, and most likely in the future, there will be technological development. And so we need to um, be able to represent different vintages of capital stocks. You need a, we need a representation of financial markets. We need to be able to have uh, uh, credit, bank credit, bonds, equities into, into our uh, uh, analytical framework. We need to have institutions, uh, uh, firms, it's obvious, uh, but also banks, other financial institutions, and also, of course, central banks. And I added also here in this category, we need a realistic representation of credit creation and allocation. So the, the let's say the traditional way of, uh, of representing banks, for instance, as pure intermediaries moving savings from one side of the economy to the other, uh, this is no longer um, uh, appropriate, uh, I would say, and uh, we need to be able to, uh, to, to represent uh, the fact that uh, commercial banks, they have a role in expanding money supply. Representation of climate damages, I put it here as a, as a question mark because it depends on your research focus. I, I usually exclude it, but there are people arguing with some reason that in order to be able to model the transition process, you also need to be able to, to represent climate damages to see how the two interact, of course. And then in this, in this long list, I put representation of networks. Uh, we need uh, to take into account both production networks, as, as we do in the, in the paper uh, that I showed you before. So this uh, exchange, web of exchanges between firms and, and sectors, and also financial networks. Uh, we probably should have a better representation of investment behavior. 
um, the typical, I will get into this uh, later as well when, when I talk about modeling, um, uh, the uh, traditional models of uh, representing investment choices um, doesn't usually include all these cognitive elements that I was mentioning before that, however, are fundamental, I would say, in trying to understand how people invest both from an individual perspective and from a, an, an aggregate perspective, especially from an aggregate perspective. Uh, you need to be able to represent structural change. Uh, so it's not enough to have a balanced growth path and then have some shock and then go back, go back to some equilibrium. You need to be able to uh, represent the uh, deep uh, shift in technological paradigms that defossilization and decarbonization would entail. And finally, you need to be able to represent policies. And unfortunately, it's not, you know, in this field, it's not enough anymore to be able to represent carbon prices or fiscal policies. You also need to be able to represent other types of policies, like the ones that uh, we mentioned uh, before. So, there is no way that any single methodology will be ever able to include all these dimensions. Uh, maybe ever is, is, is a bit premature to say, I don't know how technological um, uh, development in this field will, will go, but we certainly are not at the, at the moment able to um, include all these dimensions in a model and have them also the mental capacity to understand what comes out. So my, uh, uh, my position here is that we need, by definition, in order to address this very complex and, and dynamic and evolving issue, we need multiple methodologies. We, we need multiple approaches in general. Uh, I gathered them into four main research strategy, strategies. Uh, conceptual frameworks is essentially what uh, I showed you before, like the, that diagram that I showed you before, or what NGFS and other central banks are doing. Imagining the future, imagining what, what could happen, right? Not from a quantitative perspective, but from a conceptual qualitative perspective. You have political economy. I, I, put, it, I put here the, the name political economy, but what I mean is the, the whole approach uh, in, for instance, um, uh, uh, governance and, and institutions and, and political science in trying to understand, for instance, what the central bank mandates is, what, what it should be, uh, what is the coordination that should be achieved with, with the government, and this type of questions, which, again, are not usually uh, uh, interpretable uh, with uh, quantitative um, uh, approaches. Uh, they could. Uh, but it probably works best if, if one looks at, because it involves also, you know, law and, and, other, and other disciplines. Um, the third bit is network analysis. Um, I, this ideally should be part of the fourth, uh, uh, part, uh, the fourth strategy modeling, dynamic modeling. At the moment, it is not, um, or not entirely. Um, I guess that CG modeling is what resembles most uh, a network being included into a dynamic modeling framework, although there the model, the, the network is there, but you know, network analysis is about studying the properties uh, of, of, the, of the network and how it evolved. So uh, usually CG models, they, they don't look at this, at this side of things. Uh, so you need, for instance, uh, network analysis like the one that I showed you before, like the, the Battistone and, um, and uh, uh, et al. and similar uh, work looking at financial networks and so on. And finally, you need uh, um, dynamic macroeconomic modeling. And this is what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my lecture. So. Andreas, um, if there is a good time to have a five minutes break, uh, it's now. I think this is an excellent choice and I would suggest that we resume in about five minutes. Uh, thank you very much for the time being. Uh, unless there are now already important questions, uh, but so far I didn't get any questions, so I think we could simply leave to this break and come back. Perhaps if somebody reflects during the break and might have another question, we can 
uh, we can or just uh, ask this, but still then continue with your with your presentation. Thank you very much for the time being. Thank you. Okay, so um, let me re share. Right, so um, dynamic modeling. Um, I uh, prepared uh, an introduction. Again, uh, um, I was looking at the, at the program of the summer school, so uh, you will have um, um, experts in, in different uh, types of, uh, of modeling approaches. So my aim here is to give you a, back, a bit of background, uh, being the, the first one uh, to go. And um, I will be brief, um, brief, briefer than, than I was planning, but I'm happy to um, take any questions later or after um, via email if you have uh, further doubts uh, or questions or curiosities. So um, a bit of history. Um, so the, 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 um, in order to understand the state of modeling in this field, uh, at the moment, I think it's useful, especially for um, researchers that may not have had the training uh, in this field, uh, to know that there is a historical background to it. And the historical background is essentially starts around the around the 60s. That's when the environmental question and the uh, question about the interaction between human societies and resources and the environment um, started um, being uh, uh, public. Um, there were many dimensions of this uh, um, of this debate. From a modeling perspective, I would say that from the very beginning, there were these two fields being formed. And uh, this is also something that you find today in the modeling approaches. On one side, you had the system dynamics, and the, on the other, you had neoclassical economics. So the, let's, let's say the, the econ department. Um, this was the, the modeling dimension of a larger debate, which you can call weak versus strong sustainability. We don't have time to go into that, but it had uh, many, many dimensions, many different streams, um, which you can still find um, in the distinction between the environmental economics and the ecological economics community, for instance. Two different approaches. So the object of study is the same which is the interaction between humans and the environment, but the approaches are structurally different. So on one side, at the time, you had uh, this, this uh, 60s and 70s discussion. You had uh, a lot of heavyweights in, in economics uh, on the neoclassical economics side that were going for um, uh, models that were, were simple, uh, they, they, were, they, they needed um, to, to be analytically tractable, um, originating in smooth dynamics, and so on. And on the other hand, you had the ecological economists, uh, um, uh, Georgescu Rogan and Daly, uh, more than anyone else, that were instead stressing uh, the materiality of the economic production uh, um, uh, process, and they were essentially embracing complexity for what it is. So let me start by this system dynamics approach. So here the, the aim um, of uh, the approach is not to go towards analytically tractable models, as an economist would tend to do, uh, but rather, as I was saying, just embracing complexity. The word is a, comp is, a, is a very complex and evolving system, and in order to be able to understand it, you need to try to represent it, and you cannot really escape uh, complexity. Uh, you need to be able to represent feedback loops, amplification effects, and so on. Uh, so this is what uh, they were they were aiming for, and uh, given also the state of the of economics at the at the time, um, they uh, they essentially uh, applied the macroeconometric uh, approach of old Keynesian models uh, to the transition question, or to the environmental question more at large. So the, the typical example here is the limits to growth. Uh, this report from 1972. Uh, that was building, uh, uh, that they, they essentially built a system dynamics model. Uh, let me show it to you. This is what it looks like, yeah? And um, uh, the system dynamics 
uh, 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 community, or they also have these softwares that, that you know, another um, uh, way of representing things. So they actually build the models using the icons to uh, stress the importance of uh, stocks and flows. So this comes also from ecological modeling. At the end, it's, it's going to be a, a, a long list of differential equations or difference equations but they represent it like this, right? So it's also a way to show you the complexity of these models. And this is the famous results. Um, these are the famous results that they had. So uh, they, they, they had different scenarios and this is the business as usual scenario that was predicting um, uh, it towards the um, yeah, 50 or 60 years. Um, so what is it? Yeah, 2100, so a few decades from now I would say. Um, a collapse uh, in the economic system due to a scarcity of natural resources. And then they were offering other types of policies. At the end, they came with, uh, uh, they, they, they basically showed this scenario where the, in the model, you, they implement a set of policies like uh, ecological taxation and a reduction of working time and reduction of fertility and, and others. And they, they, they uh, present this as the, as the the good scenario, a, a steady state, sorry, a stationary state um, uh, economy in which humans can still flourish, but material flows are kept constant. Yeah. So you can see how there is already a, a very strong normative um, uh, positioning here. Uh, the type of policies that, that they promote um, are of a certain type. So this is, uh, incredibly famous and influential um, as, a, as a report and as a model. And of course, it attracted a lot of attention from uh, the economics field as well. And economists, as you might imagine, they were not, not particularly enthused uh, by, by, this, by this approach. Because on one side, um, uh, you know, this was the 70s was when the whole uh, micro foundation revolution came about with the Lucas critique and so on. So these are models that are typical, uh, you know, or, or they, they basically fit, as I was saying, with the, with the old macroeconometric models. So they, they don't have individual behavior. They don't have micro foundations. They don't have intertemporal optimization. They don't have forward looking expectations and so on. And so um, this really clashed with the, um, uh, frame, with the theoretical framework that economists at the time were developing based on general equilibrium. And uh, um, uh, this attracted a lot of criticism. And I think it also spurred uh, what then became uh, the uh, traditional um, uh, 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 model in climate economics from the economics discipline. Yeah? Uh, Nordhaus um, uh, was also one of the main critics of the Limits to Growth report uh, already in the 70s. Right? And um, uh, this was, let's say, the, the DICE model, which is the mild, you know, like a cornerstone of uh, modern climate economics, um, was also originated by the desire of reacting uh, to these other types of models that didn't have micro foundation, didn't have optimization, and so on. So the DICE model came uh, in, the, in the late 80s, was, was developed in the late 80s, came out in the early 90s, and it, it is essentially, I mean, I cannot stress enough how, how relevant it was. Um, I saw from the program that uh, the suggested videos for, for this afternoon include one from, from Nordhaus and one from Keen. Uh, Steve Keen is um, one of the main uh, uh, active, active critics of Nordhaus and climate economics, traditional climate economics. Um, however, you know, it, 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 he has a number of, of good reasons. Uh, to criticize this, uh, this modeling, but it is beyond any doubt, I feel, um, that uh, this is um, uh, something that you cannot really escape, right? It's the model in climate economics. Indeed, uh, this then spurred uh, a number of uh, other models, better models, way better models, more sophisticated and more disaggregated in technology uh, and, um, uh, and um, with uh, better uh, dynamic features as well, better climate modules and, and so on. Uh, but they are all built on this 
simple framework that Nordhaus was was uh, proposing. Right, so they have a number of features that are very, very similar. The structure is the same. Uh, for instance, key one uh, that you have later, uh, uh, he is in Yasa. Yasa actually has a number of integrated assessment models, but this is one, uh, the, the message model uh, that is usually used in IPCC uh, projections and so on. So this is, let's say, the mainstream in the sense of the, the main stream of climate economic modeling work. The typical uh, integrated, uh, economic, uh, integrated assessment modeling economic structure, um, uh, you will hear more uh, from Kiwan, I'm guessing, um, later uh, this morning, um, they, they, they have a very detailed uh, representation of technology. So if it's one uh, uh, module, uh, so the, this uh, in models have three modules, an economy, a climate, and an, and, an, and an energy module. So the energy module has been very much developed. So it's very granular, very disaggregated. They have a, a precise representation of technologies. The climate module is also uh, very well developed. Um, uh, it, he might be able to confirm it, but my, my feeling is that nowadays these, these integrated assessment models, they actually link to climate models, not modules. So they have these big, large climate models, and they, they link their economic model to, to the climate model to get uh, climate uh, information into their model. And the economic module is uh, so far the least developed one. It's based on... Uh, uh, an intertemporal optimization. So usually it's, it's either a maximization of welfare, uh, which is a function of consumption, or a minimization of, of costs. It depends on where the model came from, whether it was an economist or an energy modeler uh, initiating all of this. Uh, but it's, it's still intertemporal optimization. So the discount rate, for instance, is a relevant uh, debate, uh, debate. How do we value the future? Uh, there are supply side models, uh, so production is, uh, there is a production function, and then uh, what is produced is allocated to either consumption or investments, or, uh, as in the DICE model, usually uh, to some mitigation activity, some unproductive mitigation activity, and usually input factors are fully utilized, so K is K, there is no uh, utilization rate there. And then emissions lead to climate damages, so you have all the debate on climate damage function that, that I won't get into now. This is a, a representation of the WITCH model that I put in the slides for uh, your reference. They can be used for a number of things. Of course, the, 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 the first thing is climate uh, is cost-benefit analysis. So you have uh, uh, the costs coming from climate impacts, the costs coming from uh, mitigating, and then you find the optimal path. And this uh, usually is equivalent to finding the optimal carbon price path, right? So you, you come up with some figures, what is the optimal, the most efficient carbon price uh, to, to implement in order to um, minimize costs or maximize welfare. You can sort of skip the damage part as well and just uh, take uh, some policy objective as a constraint. Like for instance, the two degrees uh, as a, as a uh, constraint on, on temperature, and uh, and then again you come up with a with an optimal uh, carbon price path, uh, optimal investment needs, optimal international transfers. I put here a couple of papers uh, to which I contributed that that um, uh, that make this type of uh, analysis. A similar but different type of uh, uh, modeling that has been developed uh, in these decades are CG models. Uh, CG models are actually, I, I think, mostly not really applied to, um, uh, to climate uh, issues or um, uh, climate-related issues. They are heavily used, for instance, in, in, uh, to answer trade-related questions. So it's not necessarily about climate, but essentially you take these big uh, multi-regional input outputs like, like the GTAP database, and then you make them uh, dynamic. The setting is a general equilibrium setting, so you, you make something happen, like you, you impose a carbon tax or uh, you model a climate damage, and then you see how this uh, um, uh, uh, system reacts to it. Um, I don't want to get too much into it uh, because um, uh, uh, Karl Steininger uh, will uh, will talk about this, and, and he's the expert on this. 
and uh, I just wanted to mention the fact that they they I wonder what his opinion is, but I guess that they can be treated as part of the same family as integrated assessment models. On the other hand, you still have this macroeconometric modeling being developed. It's minoritarian. Um, it's sometimes referred to as heterodox, um, but it's it's there. Uh, the most prominent example, to my knowledge, is this model by Cambridge Econometrics. It's called E3ME, where they have, again, uh, it's, a, it's a very large model with multiple regions, multiple sectors, multiple technologies, and uh, what they do is essentially they don't optimize. They, uh, they, they have macroeconometric relations linking uh, crucial variables of, of the model, and they make the, the model run according to certain scenarios. And this is, for instance, a paper, I forgot to put the link here, it, it came out on, on nature climate change. It's, it's relevant for this because it's about stranded assets um, and, uh, by Mercure et al. And they use this model in order to come up with certain estimates of asset stranding um, in the future. All of these, traditionally, uh, all of these models, they have weak links with macroeconomics and finance. As I, as I was saying, you know, um, it depends on what your research question is, of course, but uh, typically the integrated assessment model, uh, um, um, the integrated assessment modeling framework is not really uh, sophisticated in its treatment of the economic system. There is no financial system. There is no networks. There are no networks. And the same applies also to uh, this macroeconometric modeling traditionally. Yeah, so they were just, let's say, two separate fields. On one side, you had the environmental or climate economic modeling, and on the other, you also had macroeconomic or finance uh, modeling um, that, again, traditionally ignored the environmental question, the, the biophysical constraints of the economy. So the SGE model or CAP models, they, they just never looked at the, at the issue. And the same applies also to, let's say, the non-neoclassical uh, uh, modeling environments. So, uh, the, 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 for instance, the stock flow consistent modeling, uh, agent-based modeling, uh, they traditionally uh, try to tackle other questions, not, not transition questions, not climate questions. As I will show you in a second, this is, this is changing. Um, but for many, many decades, these were separate fields. Um, so this is just a summary. I will leave it there. I, I won't go into the into the detail. A summary that 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 um, um, I prepared uh, to um, highlight what the main uh, features, the distinctive features of these two different approaches, right? So this equilibrium versus non-equilibrium, or neoclassical versus heterodox, or um, optimization versus complexity. You, you can define them, in, you can call them different things, but essentially you have these two big blocks of modeling approaches. One that is based on intertemporal optimization, equilibrium, it's supply driven, you have usually rational agents, uh, you have forward looking expectations, um, and uh, and so on. And on the other hand, you have the the, the uh, um, uh, successors of this macroeconometric uh, modeling of the 70s, where uh, things are demand driven, uh, expectations are adaptive. There is no necessarily not rational the rationality in the choices that are made. There is not necessarily an equilibrium, and there is a, a, a stress on the endogeneity of money. So they're the ones that have been usually um, including already this, um, this, this point about uh, banks creating credit um, that um, I put in my wish list of methodological features. And this is another paper by Mercure, but I will skip the slide. Uh, you have the link. It's, it's an interesting paper if you want and makes also these this points that I'm making. Okay, so what are the modeling strategies here, given this, this context? So we, we, we are now at, at today. Uh, what can we do? So I essentially came up with this uh, for uh, possible ways of, of moving forward. On one side, you have improving the existing climate economic modeling frameworks, like integrated assessment models and, and CGE. So you, you put some, some more macro, some more finance into it, or uh, you use the, the neoclassical macro approaches 
and include climate or transition components there, uh, or you use this complexity approach. And here I distinguish between stock flow and agent-based models because they, 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 they are part of the, let's say, of the same non-equilibrium complexity field, but they are different in, in a number of ways. So let me say a few more words about this. Um, okay, so this is just what I just said. So improve existing integrated assessment models. This is actually very difficult, you know, um, because um, it, it, integrated assessment models uh, framework, they do not really, um, they, it's, it's not easy to think of how you could include financial elements or a network. You know, it would essentially change the nature of the, of this, of the model so much that you might think it's, it's not an integrated assessment model anymore. Uh, at least not the way we know it. Uh, it's um, also difficult because um, the typical perspective is a very long one because you want to be able to include also climate damages and so this leads uh, modelers to look at at the end of the century essentially and so financial volatility and you know this type of disruptions they they might just be smoothed away for the for the sake of the research question that is looking at, at climate damages. I want to mention this, uh, this um, attempt of doing that. Um, that uh, there might be others. This is the one that I'm more familiar with. It's a paper by uh, Diaz and, and others uh, on nature climate change in 2016. They essentially take the DICE model. They make some assumptions uh, about how the DICE model might uh, uh, relate to financial um, asset um, values, to outstanding values, and then they calculate the value uh, at risk um, uh, in, a, in a business as usual scenario or in a mitigation uh, scenario. Um, essentially, they, they stress the fact that um, uh, BAU in, in, a, in a business as usual um, scenario, you have a higher uh, value at risk in the mean, but especially in the higher, um, in, the, in the 99th percentile. Um, the, if you read the paper, it's a really good paper, and uh, I, I think that the authors might might agree with me that it's anyway based on quite heroic assumptions, right? On how they connect uh, uh, the, the the dice variables to financial variables. So um, it's it's something that let's say it, it can be improved, it can be built upon. Uh, CG models. Um, again, uh, Carl is, is probably the, the person to say this, uh, but I am aware of, for instance, a, a few papers, one in particular that, that I wanted to mention here that recently came out on climatic change, and they look at public debt implications of climate impact. So there is a financial component, a macro financial component. And again, uh, these are the results. Uh, we don't have to go into, into them uh, now. The, the essential result is that if you start adapting now, um, uh, instead of, of waiting for climate damages, then you have uh, lower um, uh, public deficits in the long term. Yeah, uh, but again, looking at the CGE models, how they treat uh, financial resources, um, uh, one might think that this is not, you know, a realistic way of, of doing things. So typically, in CGE models, for instance, there is this uh, um, international bank, so all savings are are collected into an international uh, pot that is then distributed according to the productivity of, of capital. So it's, let's say, it's something that they need in order to make the model work. And for some, certain research questions, it, it's fine, right? Because you don't want to stress uh, that specific uh, issue. But if we are talking about the macro-financial dimensions of a transition, then we might want to um, uh, improve it, but it's it's actually very difficult for many reasons, including the fact that some there are some structural approaches, modeling approaches that um, clash with uh, what we need, with what I presented to you as my ideal wish list. For instance, they're based. This paper is based on crowding out assumptions. The public, the the the, the government can uh, in, that can take deficits to adapt. But it can only do so by stealing savings away from private investors. While this is not a realistic representation of, of, of economic dynamics in that 
uh, there's not necessarily a crowd in Gaza, right? Because banks can uh, finance investments even if the government in, uh, is, is taking additional deficits. Okay, second approach is to apply macro modeling uh, to transition. It, it is being done. I put here some, some references that um, I think they're quite representative of, of the state, but I might be missing something. Anyway, um, it started very recently with this couple of contributions uh, looking at uh, real business cycle models and, and including uh, emissions. Uh, there were no banks, no central banks, no financial investors at the beginning. It was mainly about carbon prices. Um, then there is this, uh, uh, these people, they essentially take the DSG framework and they include emissions or shocks related to emissions or they distinguish between two different types of, um, uh, of firms, uh, a low carbon and a high carbon. So they're trying to adapt uh, the DSG model or the Kyotaki Moore type of framework in this case of Commerce for the Spiganti to, to these type of questions. And uh, uh, even more recently or simultaneously, um, these are the two main papers. I think these two papers, I put the link here, these two papers are probably the state of the art when it comes to uh, linking uh, financial asset modeling uh, to integrated assessment models. They, they try to create a combination of the two. Uh, they are indeed uh, quite complex models and uh, it's, it's not trivial at all to, to, to uh, make them, but not even to read them. Uh, but I suggest that you have a look if, if you have an interest. And then there is a more let's call it traditional uh, growth theory strand uh, um, uh, where you have um, um, you know, Ramsey type of uh, growth models where uh, these this authors, for instance, they look at physical stranding. So they introduce what I was saying before as one of my uh, wish list desires, they introduce capital utilization rates. Right? So there might be some locations in which it is optimal. This is what they show, it might be optimal to leave some of the high carbon capital unutilized. Let me move on. Uh, okay, so this is um, um, a, a list of, of issues with, uh, with this type of models. And re remember, I'm always comparing them to, to, to this wish list that, uh, that I was um, uh, telling you about. Um, so um, there are some structural features like uh, no money creation, the reliance on shocks usually. So you, you need, for instance, in TFP, in, uh, in DSG models, you need a TFP shock or some other type of shock. So there is not an endogenous transition or endogenous crisis mounting on. So you miss some of the explanatory power uh, using these technologies. Uh, this, using this modeling. Um, supply side, uh, so usually there is no underutilization, there are no networks, no sentiments, and other uh, problems. Let me, let me just be brief uh, in the interest of time. Uh, stock flow consistent modeling. I put here um, just a, a, a slide um, to explain what they are because my, you, you might not be really aware. Essentially, these are models that start from a balance sheet representation of the economic system. We'll show you a, an example in a second. And then they, uh, uh, they, they're not optimized. They come up with some behavioral uh, functions for consumption, for investments. Or financial investment, so they are, as I said, similar to the to the old Keynesian uh, uh, type of uh, macroeconometric uh, modeling. And uh, these are a couple of examples. Um, this is probably the, the most relevant one, uh, the the Fermos uh, uh, model in, in this field. Uh, I put this. Uh, the the very interesting also because um, uh, for you maybe uh, because they essentially um, take Steve Keen's. Uh, macroeconomic modeling, uh, it's a sort of uh, Godwin uh, uh, type of um, uh, uh, dynamics uh, that he proposes and they take it and they apply it to the, uh, to the climate question. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting read. 
But essentially, this is what I mean by stock flow consistent. You see, you, you have uh, certain institutional sectors and they uh, have certain assets. Monetary assets is the stress by which monetary assets, they need to be recorded twice. The same goes for monetary flows. So it's a, they're an asset for someone, they must be a liability for someone else. And then you, you essentially look at what happens under different scenarios or different assumptions. Finally, agent-based models. I will be super quick here because uh, uh, Paula uh, will give a lecture uh, tomorrow or, or uh, anyway, this week, and uh, I will leave it to her. But the idea of agent-based models is, once again, to try to move towards the complexity uh, side, right? Uh, to um, be able to spot emerging properties and, and, and feedback effects. Um, it is traditionally um, similar to SFC in that it is based on adaptive expectations. There is limited rationality or, or fundamental uncertainty, and it can be used to, um, to uh, look at uh, a number of, uh, of different research questions. Um, but again, Paola will talk about this. Okay. Issues with uh, SFC, this is my last slide, I think. Um, my, so I, I, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of, of, this, of these methods uh, because I think they provide alternatives right, to the, to the neoclassical, which, which the neoclassical methods are super useful to analyze uh, certain research questions. Some things, some dimensions are out, and so this it might be complemented by this type of, uh, of, mo uh, of modeling. Um, the main issue I have is with uh, how they treat expectations in that I understand that um, uh, a forward-looking agent that looks into the future from now to infinity and then optimizes accordingly might be a bit of a stretch. Uh, but also, adaptive expectations are essentially at the other extreme. So they're, they're, you know, I look at the, at the present and possibly at the past, and then I extrapolate into the very next period. And uh, while I believe that uh, human beings might not uh, really optimize, but they might more satisfy than optimize, but they do look at the, at the, at the future. They uh, build imagined futures, imagined scenarios, and then they act, act accordingly. So one thing that I'm trying, for instance, to do with, with other authors is uh, an old paper. Um, we have another one um, coming out. Um, is to try to include forward-looking behavior in this type of models. And there is all this animal spirits literature, so Frank and the Grauve, and uh, they, they are expanding and trying to put sentiments in. Uh, and expectations and sentiments, of course, are, are very much related. And uh, in agent-based models as well, uh, there is the black box problem. Um, it's very difficult to calibrate them, validate them. It's difficult to understand the results most of the times. It's just really difficult to understand the validity uh, of, uh, of what comes out. Even if you trust the researcher, uh, it, 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 it is beyond human uh, mind uh, most uh, times. And, but this is the point, right, of, as I said, of system dynamics, of complexity. Um, you're not able to master the, the, all the details of uh, the word dynamics, and um, it makes sense that you don't entirely understand what goes on in the model if the model is a good representation. Okay, let me conclude. Um, as I said, uh, we have a societal objective, which is a, a rapid and smooth uh, low carbon transition. Um, there are numerous gaps in our understanding at the moment. Uh, uh, for instance, what, what is blocking low carbon investments? How do we shift them? Um, how do we shift investments to low carbon activities? And then on the other hand, we don't know whether the transition might lead to heavy disruptions, of financial instability, and so on. And we still don't know exactly how to mitigate or adapt to these transition risks. Uh, my, my, my take here is that there is no single way uh, to answer these questions. We need several approaches. We need multiple disciplines here because the transition will involve different spheres of the um, of, of the human realm. And so we need different tools um, to uh, analyze them. And uh, uh, more specifically, in the dynamic macroeconomic modeling sphere, I see these four possible complementary research strategies. 
um, they don't really, I don't think they actually go one against the other because they, they offer different type of, types of insights. Uh, but what I would like to do uh, in the coming years is to try to come to uh, some sort of cross-fertilization uh, of the two uh, with a particular stress on how expectations and investment behavior um, are treated. Okay, thank you very much. I hope uh, this was uh, useful and um, uh, instrumental to uh, let you understand whatever comes next uh, in this um, summer school. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Emanuele. We are already biting into uh, our break time. Um, we have only two questions, fortunately. Uh, and I think the best would be the questioners present the questions to you themselves also uh, by their voices if they, if they want to, or you could simply read it. Uh, so the first question is, on other ways, maybe if I understand, understand it correctly, on other ways to to uh, influence the transition, uh, possibly more direct ways. For example, uh, as, as the questioner Julia asked, whether the uh, there should be incentives to reduce power use itself. So that comes to kind of uh, um, command and control measures to. To, um, to incentivize uh, climate um, neutral behavior. Um, mm -hmm. This is another area which you, you haven't looked at so far, but that would might be interesting to hear your opinion on this. And then Wolfgang has also a, a question on, um, and perhaps it's better to, to give it directly to you. Yeah, hi, Marvin. Hi. Ah, sorry. So my question simply is, uh, you have been talking about the uh, transition risks that are triggered by policy decisions like the introduction of a carbon tax, uh, but we know that transition risks can be caused by other instances, for example, technological innovation or shifts in consumer preferences. And I just wonder whether you're aware of any literature where someone has modeled the impact of let's say, technological innovation on traditional risks. That's all. Uh, right. So um, I, will, I will start by this because um, it's, uh, it's probably easier. The, the, the questions by uh, Julia are um, very difficult to answer. But um, I do know a couple of uh, pieces of research, and I can circulate them, but I'm pretty sure you actually um, uh, stumbled across them already, too. So you're, you're right in that uh, policy changes are the usual way in which one would uh, try to um, understand the, 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 the transition risks um, dimension, uh, because they're probably uh, easier. Uh, to, to implement in a model, and uh, they're more easy to understand, and, and so on. Uh, there, there is uh, the um, uh, E3ME people. So really, that paper that I was mentioning uh, um, at some point, the one on nature climate change by Mercure et al., uh, 2018, 2019, I can send it to you. Um, they have that. They have they have policies, but they also make the point. They they actually make this point that uh, the, the transition risks uh, might originate from uh, technological breakthrough without any policies. So that's really like a point that they're making. We should talk about this. So this is one thing to to look at. And the other one um, is the DMB. Mm, um, is the DMB report, uh, I'm blanking on the name now, um, but uh, there is a report uh, from 2018 or 2019 in which they, they, they do also have a scenario in which they have uh, quicker than expected uh, technological uh, development and they, and they look at how this might affect, um, uh, you could create economic costs and so on. But uh, yeah, it's, it's less developed. And, um, uh, 
Julia, um, maybe maybe um, Andreas, uh, because I'm I'm just uh, worried about uh, your uh, time management. Uh, maybe I can have a separate conversation with uh, with you, Julia, uh, because it's a really interesting question. But I don't feel like I'm able to reply in in a minute. I'm happy, of course, with this proposal. Um, might be interesting then to get the result of your uh, individual debate then later on. Um, and perhaps you could then have a, a you know, could then spread it. So now let's have some idea. It's just another five minutes of break. I hope people are not too angry that we extended already with our first session. Um, but yeah, let's keep it uh, the, the plan table as it is and start in, in about five minutes. Uh, so see you later then. Bye. Thank you very much, Emanuele, once again, by the way. <laughs> it was a great speech and really gave us the basic ideas of what is going on in this very complex debate about very complex issues. But at least you helped us to reduce at least the bit this complexity, at least for the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and good luck with the uh, prosecution. Okay, thank you, too. Bye. Uh, Kevin Riai is the director of uh, the energy program of uh, IASA, the International Institute for uh, Applied System Analysis. Uh, and visiting professor at University Graz of Technology. Um, since 2018, he's also fellow at the of a PN Institute in the Colorado School of Mines and external faculty member at the Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of Amsterdam. He leads a number of international research efforts, including EU-funded projects on greenhouse gas emissions and climate policies. So the lead author on the review uh, on, on various issues of the uh, IPCC report and is also already a leading contributor to the current uh, uh, work for the next uh, IPCC report. Uh, yeah, um, and I think the floor is now yours and uh, thank you very much for joining us. What I also should mention is that you already cooperated with the uh, with the Central Bank and Supervisors Network for Greening of the Financial System by contributing to uh, work on the um, on various um, uh, scenarios for 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 our work there. Perhaps you might also uh, allude a bit to this, but now uh, I give the floor to you. Uh, you know how to deal with uh, with uh, sharing your, your slides. If you have ones, uh, you have the power. You can do everything you want with, with, your, with the screen. Okay. So first of all, thanks a lot for having me here and, and, and for introducing me. It's a, it's a big pleasure. Uh, to give uh, to give the seminar, uh, I had some um, technical problems. I had to move to a new computer. So while you were introducing me and trying to download my own presentations, because WebEx didn't work on my other computer, very very strange. At least I couldn't get into your meeting. So give me perhaps one minute to download all my files <laughs> so that I can upload things. But yeah, so download is actually completed. Um, yeah, so so um, as as you already mentioned, so my my background is um, that I'm I'm the director of the energy program at IASA uh, with um, uh, ample experience on integrated assessment modeling and having been involved since the 1990s in the assessment reports of the IPCC. Um, and in my lecture, I will focus. Um, on um, what can we learn uh, from the uh, typical energy economic climate uh, scenarios? How, how are they developed? And then a little bit go also into the details of a recent set of scenarios that we have been um, uh, 
um, uh, uh, putting forward and, and, and develop for the NGS uh, and NGSF. Um, but my main part will be on integrated assessment, how um, do different, how do insights from energy economics modeling feed into the big uh, climate assessments? And um, so that will be the first part. I suggest making we have a uh, quick break and then have a discussion about uh, modeling tools and scenarios. And then uh, the second part would then focus specifically on the NGSF scenarios. Um, with this, let me see whether I can share my screen. I'm a Zoom user, but I think, um, and this is a different computer. Okay, I think this is the right screen, probably. The middle, yeah, just in the arrow, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see it already. Then I should probably make this screen bigger. And then probably now you see the presentation mode, I assume. Yeah, do you see the slides? Perfect. Perfect, great, great. Um, yeah, before perhaps um, you going into integrated assessment modeling, um, I thought it might be, so that's the outline of my uh, presentation, as I indicated before, uh, to we will um, first uh, look into integrated assessment models and related scenarios and then in, insights for the IPCC. I'm focusing a little bit on the recent special report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, the IPCC that I could uh, contribute to, and then the NGSF, NGFS uh, um, the scenarios. Um, yeah, so let me start perhaps with the most recent um, with the most recent IPCC report, simply to frame uh, what uh, uh, climate science in terms of uh, changes in climate uh, tells us about the required uh, pace and um, required pace of the transformation and the emissions uh, pathways that would be consistent with uh, limiting climate change uh, to a, a level well below two degrees, and particularly. Uh, um, perhaps also to um, trying to reach even lower levels uh, of warming, uh, which is one and a half degrees, which is which is the target which is emphasized in the in the in the Paris Agreement. In order to uh, limit climate change to one and a half degrees, what is necessary is is to um, basically stay within a certain limit of a carbon budget and. Um, uh, what we have to do is we have just a limited carbon budget available that we can uh, emit into the atmosphere. And depending on which level of temperature change you want to stabilize, uh, that carbon budget will become smaller. Historically, uh, we have emitted uh, around uh, 2,200 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere and have changed the concentration of the, of the atmosphere to that. Uh, this has caused roughly a degree of warming so far. And in order to uh, stay within one and a half degrees, there is this remaining carbon budget. And the remaining carbon budget, on the one hand, depends on how many non-CO2 greenhouse gases are emitted. So there is not only CO2 uh, emitted by coal power plants and fossil fuels, but also by deforestation. There are non-CO2 gas gases uh, emitted, for example, by the agricultural sector, uh, methane and N2O being the most prominent ones. And depending on how much of those emissions we emit, um, uh, that will reduce the available uh, or the remaining CO2 budget within which uh, we need to stay. And this remaining CO2 uh, um, uh, budget has been uh, subject uh, to an assessment of the IPCC in the one and a half degrees report. Um, it strongly depends on uh, the likelihood uh, by, within, um, uh, of the target. If you want to limit, for example, uh, temperature change to one and a half degrees with a 50-50 chance, then this remaining budget is around 580 gigatons of CO2 in the future. If you want to limit warming uh, with a 66% chance, uh, the 
uh, the, the, the cumulative emissions of the budget for the future is 420 gigatons of CO2. Uh, there are important uncertainties associated with this budget. On the one hand, as I said earlier, it's dependent on how successfully we can uh, limit or reduce the emissions of non-CO2 gases and that uncertainty. Um, uh, looking into different model estimates uh, translates into an uncertainty of the budget of about plus minus 250 gigatons of CO2. And then there is the geophysical uncertainty of the climate system itself, uh, which uh, basically adds another uncertainty of plus minus 400 gigatons. Uh, are these numbers big or small? I think are illustrated that at the moment we are emitting 42 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, so uh, a budget of about uh, 200 gigatons of CO2 means uh, a difference of uh, more or less uh, five years of uh, current emissions and the budget uh, that we have here for staying below the likely chance basically is exhausted after 10 years. So the expectation is that if we uh, don't uh, make any, if we don't reduce CO2 emissions and continue with emissions at today's levels, we will have exhausted the central value uh, for the one and a half degrees target to stay likely below that uh, already by 2030. So that dictates, of course, a certain urgency of how quickly we need to reduce emissions. Uh, these carbon budget um, estimates are included in integrated assessment models as a constraint to depict uh, um, different uh, transformations from main underlying uh, um, systems, the systems like the energy sector and land use systems. And I want, before I go to the integrated assessment models, to show you a typical result that you uh, get for, from those type of models. Uh, so basically, what you can see here is the historical development of greenhouse gas emissions um, and an estimate across different models of where actually the current uh, contributions or suggestions from different countries, the so-called nationally determined contributions, which are country pledges uh, resulting from the Paris Agreement process, uh, will lead us. And then uh, those estimates of um, implementation of the NDC proposals are compared to the real needs of how quickly we need to reduce emissions, for example, across a range of different models for a two degree scenario. So in order to stay uh, within two degrees is a likely chance, uh, we need to roughly have an early peak around uh, today. We need to very quickly decarbonize and, uh, the electricity system and um, also increase the efficiency and, and scale up zero carbon uh, options. Um, in many of those scenarios, we reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by around 2070. And in the long term, even the global system is turned into uh, an, an, an sink. So we have negative emissions in some scenarios that reach two degrees by, for example, creating energy to biomass and then um, extracting the CO2 from the fuel gas and putting it back on the ground, which creates negative emissions technology, or for example, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by uh, afforestation and enhancing the biospheric uh, think tank. So these are roughly emissions pathways. I, I think you can see quite, um, quite obviously that this is a very ambitious task, but nevertheless, on the political level, uh, there is an agreement that we should have an ambition even to stay within one and a half degrees. And these are the, it is the green belt, the green emission scenarios here, which means even achieving net zero GHG emissions earlier by around 2050. And all of these scenarios include um, to, um, to a larger or to a smaller extent in the long term post 2050 and negative emissions uh, from, um, uh, from anthropogenic. Uh, activities. So the gap between uh, where we need to be uh, to reach uh, one and a half degrees or two degrees and where future emissions will lead us is uh, very high and uh, that's why we need to think about how to accelerate um, how to accelerate um, uh, the upscaling of the related options and also 
um, uh, how to accelerate those options and how to reduce emissions in the near term and how to in introduce policies. For uh, those scenarios are generally cre created the so-called uh, process-based integrated assessment models. Um, these are uh, models that include different subsystems. Uh, they include usually a very um, a detailed energy sector where uh, you uh, basically represent all different energy conversion stages uh, from the extraction of fuels uh, as primary energy. You have a, a detailed representation of uh, renewable uh, potentials and, and, and costs uh, of, 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 of technologies all the way down to different service levels representing mobility, uh, shelter, uh, to some extent even in the, in the more recent models where we try to uh, look into materials, material intensity and what does it mean uh, for the industrial sector. So you have a very detailed energy sector uh, which is uh, usually coupled with a detailed representation of agriculture and land use changes. Uh, usually these are different modeling frameworks that are coupled with each other and, and agriculture and land use models are much more granular on the spatial and the regional scale than the energy models. And um, uh, the, in the main linkage between energy and agriculture is of course through, uh, let's say, policies that would um, uh, lead to um, land uh, use by, uh, to, uh, for production of energy, like liquid fuels or biomass for electricity or, or heating. And those can, of course, lead to competition uh, with food production in the agricultural sector. So the models try to represent these trade-offs and also uh, different productivities of land given different uh, uh, climate changes. Um, agricultural sector and the energy sector are coupled with each other and both require water. So many of the integrated process-based detailed models include hydrological cycles um, and uh, try to uh, cover basically different usages of water for agriculture, but also for the electricity system. Here, water is particularly important for uh, fossil power plants that need, uh, need cooling. And, um, and those different systems are now embedded into the representation of the economy and different sectors. And uh, models differ a lot with regards to the granularity of um, different economic sectors, ranging from uh, so-called computational general uh, equilibrium models that try to represent um, up to 17 different economic sectors, down to more systems engineering models that uh, basically have a very co coarse representation of the economy. Uh, so the, 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 the human uh, land and biophysical uh, systems are then coupled in these models with um, a representation of the atmosphere and ocean systems. Basically, um, either this is done endogenously, but in most of the models, there's an, there's an additional module that is linked uh, to the um, to the land and energy and the water systems. Uh, basically, emissions are fed into the uh, into the into the into the climate models, and there they translate into changes of concentration of greenhouse gases and uh, also um, um, the carbon cycle is represented in those models. So these are highly nonlinear uh, representations of feedbacks between different systems. These models are generally used as um, uh, strategic in, in a, for strategic decision making and to see how the system responds and making assumptions about different types of constraints. And among those also constraints are trying to limit climate change. So basically, you could take a model like this and say, okay, the carbon budget in the future should not exceed 400 gigatons of CO2. And then the model would, would basically respond to those changes by introducing major uh, transformations in agriculture and the energy system. And, and, do, and, 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 and the models try to do this in an internally consistent, consistent way. What are important uh, input assumptions into those models? Uh, there are many exogenous inputs. 
as we can imagine, exogenous assumptions include, at the one hand, uh, demographic changes and population developments in the future, which are generally um, um, uh, provided by uh, demographic groups, um, um, and, and I, I will show a few examples later. There are also assumptions about uh, productivity change in the future, like labor productivity assumptions are in most of the scenarios exogenous. Technological improvements, uh, like for example, learning of technologies and most models still exogenous. There are some that include uh, feedbacks on, on innovation, but most models uh, do not uh, have this endogenously. Uh, policies, of course, are important exogenous assumptions. These can be policies about climate, but this can be equally policies about um, other issues like, uh, like um, uh, water sustainability or um, uh, national policies on agriculture and, and, and also trade policies. And then finally, uh, the models have a relatively detailed representation of different resources, energy, fossil fuel resources, renewables, and so on. And this is uh, also grounded in um, evidence uh, coming from uh, different, uh, from the literature. Mostly these are geological surveys or other institutions that explore in detail what, what, uh, what sorts of renewable resources are, for example, available. And these are then uh, fed into the models. Um, with a set of exogenous assumptions, uh, one can run each model, and the typical output uh, is uh, of an integrated assessment model is then consistent with the input assumptions, certain policy assumptions. You get then a, a solution space or solution vector for future greenhouse gas emissions, uh, prices of different commodities, including prices, for example, from CO2 emissions. Um, feedbacks on how these prices of different commodities would impact the economy um, in terms of um, uh, GDP and GDP losses, uh, what's the future portfolio of primary energy as well as electricity generation, agricultural practices, number of like, livestock, um, etc. So that's, that's um, very, it's a very broad brush generally. Uh, the, the representation or the, the most important modules and assumptions and inputs in an uh, integrated assessment uh, modeling framework. And I call them specifically modeling frameworks because they, this, uh, this is usually not, not everything is put into one model at the same time. You have different individual modules that, uh, that um, are coupled to each other, and usually solutions are achieved by iterating uh, quantity and price information between the different, different uh, sub-modules. Yeah, so, so as, I, as I said earlier, integrated assessment models are used to test the response of the system to different policy. Um, there are no predictions of what will happen, so, so they are no, there is no crystal ball here. Um, uh, they rather uh, provide some answers in terms of what, what if, so what would happen if certain assumptions conditional on the input assumptions and conditional on the assumed policies. Um, the typical question um, is, for example, how much would it cost to limit CO2 emission to a certain level, and what sort of measures would need to impl be implemented in different sectors. Um, this approach is very different. Uh, this process-based IEMs are very different from uh, the more aggregated macroeconomic cost-benefit frameworks, uh, which are also called integrated assessment models in the literature. There's uh, usually a confusion about and um, the perhaps outside the community, what is an integrated assessment model? So there are also very aggregated models like DICE, PAGE, or FUND, uh, which uh, serve a different purpose. Uh, they are much more um, they, are, they, are, they are much more aggregated, and they try to basically aggregate information about uh, mitigation on a very macro perspective. Is information about impacts on the macro perspective and try to find the optimal, um, uh, the optimal reductions, for example, by looking at the balance between impacts and, and, and mitigation costs. 
um, um, in, the, in the IPCC, but also uh, more, more more generally when you think about mitigation, um, uh, the, the, the many uh, the, the process-based indicated assessment models are used in an in a, in a, in a so-called so cost-effective approach. So you are interested to understand what's the cost-effective approach to reach a certain policy target, which is a very different question, and therefore also the tools are very, uh, very different. Here. There are only a handful of institutions around the world, but increasing number um, that maintain fully integrated uh, capabilities. I'm listing here uh, particularly six of the most, uh, um, I would say, for the most uh, for the, for the, for the, um, most known ones, and which are used also uh, for the development of the so-called uh, reference concentration pathways uh, in the IPCC, the RCPs, which have been hi highlighted in the AR5. Um, these are um, uh, the tools to differ though very, very to, to differ a lot. And uh, what they have in common here is that they have a very detailed representation of all systems in these models, uh, but um, they come also from different uh, modeling paradigms and backgrounds. Uh, for example, two of these models are uh, typical uh, general equilibrium models uh, uh, rooted uh, strongly in, uh, in uh, macroeconomics and have a very detailed representation of economic sectors. Um, there are um, there is uh, one model here with a strong, uh, that's the message model that we employ here at IASA, uh, which has a, uh, which has a strong tradition in systems engineering modeling, uh, trying to understand uh, bottom-up solutions uh, from the engineering perspective, uh, both on the land and at the at the, at the energy side. Just to give you an idea, uh, the big message Blue Biome framework includes 120 modelers uh, working on this framework alone at our institute, and there are many collaborating institutions um, with, with whom we collaborate. And, uh, this, um, and um, so our strength is not the macroeconomy, our strength is trying to understand um, the details in terms of the engineering and biophysical side. And then there are models like the image model, which come more from the simulation uh, uh, paradigm and, and try to understand, um, given historical development of relative prices and shares of the contribution of different um, uh, technologies in the portfolio, uh, if you simulate those into the future, um, um, how, how the system could evolve. I think. I think it's useful to have these different paradigms and these different modeling frameworks to be to, to come really from different um, directions because then model comparisons can help you to understand what's robust if you take really different approaches to the economy. And that's what is usually done uh, within the scientific community. We try to develop uh, basically pathways or scenarios that share certain assumptions and input assumptions, and then you use different models to see how the system might respond, and then try to understand in, on which aspects you have big uncertainty and on which aspects these models do, uh, do, do agree. So the diversity of approaches, I think, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, an, is an asset. And um, what has happened also over the, I would say, over the last perhaps 20, 15 years is uh, that the community has uh, organized itself very strongly um, so that um, the economic assessments uh, can be based on a common framework and assumptions. And uh, basically, no matter what sort of climate assessments uh, uh, you do, you have the possibility to use a set of assumptions and, and make your results comparable to results of others. And the main mean for doing so are the so-called shared socioeconomic pathways at the moment. These are the FSPs. Uh, they allow the community to explore uh, uncertainties in a systematic way. Um, basically, the two main dimensions of the scenario space in this analysis is the challenge to mitigate or the challenge to adapt. So basically, if you think about if you live in a climate change world, you are interested in the question 
uh, how can I reduce emissions and given certain uncertainties, reducing emissions in the future might be more difficult or more, more easy. This is here the vertical axis, the challenge challenges to mitigation. So the different shared socioeconomic pathways differ a lot in terms of future developments that determine the challenge to mitigation. And then on the other side, you have challenge to adaptation. And uh, basically, this describes the socioeconomic conditions where it will be more difficult for people to adapt to climate impacts or not. And within these uh, five different uh, scenarios have been identified, the central case, middle of the road, which basically combines assumptions about intermediate mitigation capacity and in intermediate adaptation capacity. But there are also other other combinations possible. Perhaps really interesting is this sustainability corner here, because it means that you have in the future socioeconomic conditions where you can relatively easily adapt, but you have also favorable conditions in terms of, of mitigation. Um, now, um, let me perhaps show you a few, um, a, a few important assumptions here. Uh, so these scenarios are based on a very wide range in terms of demographic changes. So these are the population assumptions in the scenarios. Scenarios from uh, at the low end, usually population increases, peaks around 2050, and then population um, uh, comes, uh, comes down again to levels uh, similar to today. Um, and on the other side, uh, the contrast to this would be um, scenarios like the SSP3, uh, where we basically have an, um, the underlying theme here is development failures, and because of that, relatively high fertility, continued high fertility in developing countries, which can lead to relatively high population growth. Um, and uh, this spans roughly the range of the possible population outcomes that uh, dem demographers see today. Um, at the other hand, there is also a big difference in the scenarios in terms of urbanization and population and urbanization. I don't want to go into the details here. Uh, I need also including different assumptions about productivity into different uh, scenarios and ranges for the economic development across the SSDs, ranging from really scenarios which are very conservative in terms of the uh, economic outlook like SSP3 um, up to scenarios which assume um, um, very high economic growth and a successful transition into a post-industrial society with very high productivity gains and leading to, to a world which might be a little bit hard to envisage from today's perspective, but um, with an average per capita income of 120,000. Uh, across the whole planet, and then we are we have at the moment 10,000. So over a century, an increase of a factor of 10 in terms of average income is the highest assumption here. Uh, now these assumptions are again, as I explained earlier, are fed into the integrated assessment models. Um, we have used here six different IEMs, uh, five different uh, SSPs that I mentioned. And each model runs each scenario. And then you select uh, representative marker scenarios where the community as a whole, this is an iterative process with many modelers and non-modelers involved uh, to identify so-called marker scenarios that are representative for a certain SSP. And you have basically then for each SSP one marker representation, but also a range of uncertainty conditional on the socioeconomic pathway. Let me show you a few um, a few outcomes which uh, which might uh, give you a feeling about what what the scenarios include. Uh, so we have basically two SSPs, um, two reference cases which are characterized by relatively low energy demand. So what I'm showing here is primary energy demand in exajoules, a very long-term time series here from 1850 to 2100. I think you can see here the SSP1 sustainability uh, scenario where you have actually, even in absence of climate policy, a transition away from fossil fuels is very low energy demand because of more efficient service sectors, um, um, issues like shared economy play here a big role. 
Uh, and at the other extreme, you have actually also a world where demand is low because of completely opposite reasons, uh, because of uh, um, relatively uh, slow, uh, relatively high inequality. So many, uh, a large fraction of the population is, is left behind, uh, but still um, with relatively good technological capabilities, which are uh, concentrated um, in, in uh, big uh, international um, uh, companies and, 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 and industries. Um, there are two scenarios which depict relatively high energy growth, um, particularly SSP5 that we can see here, uh, shows a fossil fuel development, coal intensive at the same time very high, leads also to the highest emissions in absence of climate policies. Uh, compared to SSP3, which is much higher than the other two scenarios that I've shown before, remember, um, uh, but uh, depicts um, also some sort of regional re re uh, um, uh, rivalry. It, um, SSP3 is a world where we have high poverty, but also very slow technological progress. And because of that, at relatively low economic development, relatively high intensities and high energy demands because technology is simply not as good. And then there is one scenario which is uh, middle of the road in the, in the middle. And if we look at all five, these are very different um, energy developments that are then projected by the five SSPs. It's important to have these differences in mind because when we use then uh, these reference uh, scenarios in absence of climate policies, the system will react very differently to climate policies, and this will also determine then issues like the transition risk or the costs of mitigation or whether the target can be achieved or cannot be achieved. And that's, um, uh, before going there, uh, perhaps I show you the, uh, this, are the this is world CO2 emissions resulting from the five SSPs. On the high side, FSP5 world, uh, which combines uh, high fossil fuel intensity with very high growth. And as I mentioned earlier, on the low side, you have more FSP1 scenarios. And this is just a range in absence of climate policies. Um, and, and then the question is, of course, um, how, what can climate policies achieve given different socioeconomic backgrounds and uncertainties? And this is shown by the so-called scenario matrix here. It looks a little bit complicated, but it's not. Um, in the columns of this matrix, you can see the different SSPs, the different short shared socioeconomic pathways. And I have ranked them now according to the increasing challenge to mitigation. So the, the further to the right you go, that, that you have all those socioeconomic pathways, so it becomes more and more difficult to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, and on, the, on the vertical axis, um, and you see uh, forcing levels, which means basically that you have here high climate, uh, high, high, high warming and high, high climate change, and you have here relatively low warming and low climate change. Um, what you can see immediately visible is the range where the scenarios, the different socioeconomic pathways end up in case there is no climate policy. So only if you have socioeconomic conditions like in SSP5, you get actually as high emissions as in, in uh, to achieve um, 8.5 watts per square meter. That's a world of greater four degrees warming. So, it's, so, so, so that's, the, that's more or less the high end scenario. The others are reference cases without climate policy. Um, these are below those. So under number of different socioeconomic conditions, we actually don't achieve these very high emissions. And the big question now is if you want to reduce forcing to get out, down to 2.6 watts per square meter, or perhaps even below 2.6 watts per square meter, uh, you need to assume uh, climate, climate policy. And the importance of this matrix is that we can now systematically look into the effect of climate policy conditional on different socioeconomic conditions. And this is something that this graph here tries to summarize. You can basically see here um, 
across different FSPs, uh, the changes in, um, in um, I think that's the average uh, that's the average carbon price, the net present value of the carbon price that we need to bring um, um, to limit forcing to either below two degrees, which is about uh, 2.6 watts per square meter. Uh, you can see here, for example, it's not possible to go there from the FSP3 baseline. So there are socioeconomic conditions under which it's not possible to reach the targets anymore. And as you can see here is that the, in the FSP1, um, under those conditions, uh, it's much cheaper to get there uh, compared to SSB5, where the challenges are big and where some models actually tell you you can get there and in other models you cannot get there. I don't want to go into the details of this graph, but I want, uh, that I want uh, I, I'm emphasizing this because I think it's really important to um, understand that um, there is a, quite some uncertainty on these economic costs. Uh, but you can handle the uncertainties if you look at them conditional on certain productivity changes, uh, technological changes in the future, demographic changes, then the range becomes more, more manageable. Um, there are a number of robust insights that emerge across all the different socioeconomic pathways. And let me emphasize those. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm now uh, switching back um, again to the uh, special report on one and a half degrees from the IPCC, which has reviewed scenarios across all different socioeconomic pathways, but also uh, for, um, has looked into, into additional other scenarios that have been developed in different other contexts. Uh, in order to limit uh, warming to one and a half degrees, uh, we need to have peak emission cuts, as I showed this earlier, but we need also to have a range of solutions, technology plus behavioral change and change in a fundamental way investments into uh, low, uh, low carbon options. What does it more concretely mean? <clears throat> it means more concretely that uh, we need to improve energy efficiency to limit final energy demand to roughly around today's level by 2050. Uh, this is an enormous big challenge because it means we need to decouple economic growth more or less from, uh, from energy demand. Um, the first sector to decarbonize in these scenarios is the power sector, which basically achieves uh, net zero emissions or negative emissions by 2050. At the same time as in those scenarios, you change the supply side, the power sector, you electrify the demand side to have a double dividend. So electrification of end use sectors, electrification of mobility, buildings, and industry, while decarbonizing electricity helps to decarbonize the whole economy. And then there are tough sectors where, it's, uh, where the electrification is very difficult. I think about feedstocks like uh, plastic, asphalt, um, but also um, other energy uses of fossil fuels are needed, for example, for industrial processes. Um, and um, those with this, for those residual emissions, one needs to find either a solution or one needs to find negative emissions to compensate uh, those emission sources, so from our forest while you reduce industrial industrial emissions. And there are very different roles for different types of fuels in this, in this transition. And let me perhaps uh, highlight a few uh, characteristics of those scenarios. So for an energy system transition towards one and a half degrees, you can see here uh, basically um, a picture which shows you uh, for different main uh, um, energy uh, members of the energy, so different main energy carriers. Um, their deployment in 2030, 2050, and 2100. Um, fossil fuels here, and you can see, I think, quite nicely that in all of these scenarios, you have a rapid reduction of, of fossil fuels, most rapidly for, for coal, perhaps the least rapid for gas. And how quickly you have to reduce those really depends on the amount of uh, carbon dioxide removal um, or a CCS, a carbon capture and storage that can be coupled 
in these fossil fuel systems. When you reduce basically the share of fossil fuels, one has to increase the contribution of renewables um, uh, quite massively and quite quickly. Um, um, I want to emphasize perhaps here biomass with CCS, uh, which shows across many scenarios uh, quite some increase, but not necessarily in all scenarios. There are also solutions which shows that we can achieve those targets without better energy and CCS, then demand side becomes more important. Um, this is the primary energy level. At the electricity level, decarbonization needs to happen even more rapidly. Uh, basically, by 2050, um, there is no coal left in the portfolio. Um, natural gas has a contribution across all scenarios in the literature, which is uh, below 10% of the portfolio, between 3 and 11%, a little bit depending again on the CCS. And this is, um, needs to be compensated by massive upscaling of zero carbon electricity options, most prominently uh, wind and solar. And renewables achieve in these scenarios basically by 2050, 70 to 85%. So that's a very, very rapid and large scale uh, fundamental structural change in how the electricity system uh, would operate. In addition to supply, you need to change also demand. As I said earlier, uh, perhaps I don't go too much into the scenario results because I'm a little bit too slow as it seems. Um, um, and what I wanted to show a little bit more in detail is the required change in the investment portfolio consistent with the physical system changes that I've shown before. And what you can see here is basically investment portfolios in the world. Uh, showing you energy investment portfolios, difference between a baseline without any carbon policy um, uh, and basically the investment portfolio of the national determined contributions, the post Paris scenarios, two a typical two degree scenario and a one and a half degree scenario. If you're interested in the uncertainty of the individual investments here, you can see these black arrow bands which show you um, um, uncertainty ranges across the individual um, um, components of the investment portfolio. And if when you go down from bottom to the top, these are um, average annual investments between 2016 and 2050 uh, on efficiency, renewables, nuclear and CCS, transmission and distribution and storage, and then the fossil extraction and the fossil power sector. Uh, two insights are here very important. First, the increase in, um, in the total investments um, is not very significant in one and a half degrees or two degree scenarios. So we're talking here about $800 billion uh, US dollars or 0.8% of the world GDP. Um, so overall, this increase is uh, or less than a bit more than 20% of the overall investment portfolio needs to be increased. This investment um, increase is not very big. However, if you look at the incremental change of the individual options, the upscaling needs into individual options is enormous. Uh, so at the one hand, you need to change the portfolio a lot by increasing uh, the investment into efficiency measures at the demand side, renewables, uh, but particularly also into the infrastructure which helps the integration of renewable energy into storage as well as into transition and uh, distribution infrastructure. And at the same time, you need to disinvest into fossil extraction as well as fossil power. And you need to do that very quickly, which also creates tensions in terms of um, industry interests and, and um, creates winners and losers in the system, uh, which uh, um, uh, which might be barriers to, 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 to rapid, uh, rapid transformations. Um, there is quite some spread across different results in terms of, of investments across different models. But one thing that is very robust here is the need to invest, to, to change the investment portfolio uh, so that uh, between 2030 and 2035, Basically, 80% of all the low-carbon investments need to happen in the renewable 
uh, factor. This doesn't mean that the by, by that time the whole sector needs to be 80% renewables, but the new additional investments need to be 80%. And that has, of course, enormous implications for uh, different um, utilities and energy suppliers. At the same time, uh, one can see um, 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 it's quite obvious from the models investments into coal uh, needs to um, stop more or less um, uh, immediately if one wants to achieve um, the climate targets with an exception, if one wants to achieve one and a half degree or a two degree climate target with the exception of uh, coal power generation with CCS uh, in some places where it is difficult. Uh, to replace coal. Um, regional investments are the highest in, in Asia, and this is because they are where the market is growing the fastest, followed by OECD. This is not an increase in investment because the energy sector is increasing, but it's basically replacing current assets, and followed then by Middle East and Africa, reforming economies, and, and Latin America. Now, let me perhaps stop here for the first half of the of the lecture and see whether there are um, any questions. If you found the, um, the presentation interesting, all the data is actually available on the web. Uh, there is an, a scenario explorer that we post at YASA, which summarizes all the scenarios by the IPCC and which can be publicly, uh, which is publicly accessible. The web page is here. And um, it's a quite neat, uh, neat tool. You can go and, um, and uh, at the one hand, um, um, basically explore the scenarios. But on the other hand, you can also visualize different aspects of the scenarios and compare different studies as you, as you feel useful. OK, so let me perhaps uh, stop um, for people to digest. and. And perhaps also to 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 have some some quick discussion. Oh, am I late? I'm late probably, right? Because I saw Andrea Breiten oh. looking at the watch. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, you of course you you are late, but like everybody so far, don't worry that much about this. Uh, we may have now a short break of some seven minutes until twelve o'clock resume then and perhaps then the, the, the next part of, of the presentation will take a bit more than half an hour, I guess, but still we'll stay more or less in the, in the, in the, in the plan fra framework. I hope everybody accepts a bit of uh, extension of our, of our time. So see you again in seven minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome, welcome. Actually, my next part will not be as long as this one, so we will manage until 1230, I think. Excuse me, uh, but I can read. Uh, I can I can read uh, the question, and it's a very good question. So the question here in the chat is that I showed that GDP is exogenous and vary across scenarios. Whether this is indeed the case, and if there is any feedback loop between the simulations and GDP, yeah, indeed I should have uh, I should have been um, more explicit here. Perhaps even. That was a bit confusing. So so there is an um, reference. GDP assumption, uh, which um, uh, the modelers are asked to uh, to replicate, uh, because uh, productivity assumptions in the future can vary very significantly. Um, but then, when we look into the uh, response of the system because of climate policies, um, let's say we include a two-degree target um, climate constraint. And then, of course, that two-degree target will change um, endogenously the prices of different goods, and um, also because of the of the of the of the of the carbon and GHG pricing, and that changes in terms of prices of different production factors are of course have of course a feedback on the. Uh, economic growth and the GDP and the, uh, and the models calculate to that uh, GDP losses. So what's exogenous is, is this reference um, long-term productivity pass, uh, but then the response of policies on the economy um, is of course endogenous. I hope this answers the question. 
Uh, yes, I, th I think so. Maybe you can go on with your presentation, please. Great, great, great. We will do that. Um, I think you can see the, the screen, right? Can you see the presentation? Yes, we see it. Okay, great, great. I didn't hear. Ah, okay, it's on the chat. Perfect. So, um, yeah, so let me now start the second part of the presentation. Uh, please mute yourself because I have a strong issue as well. I think this comes from Wolfgang Point. No? Ah, yeah, now it's better. Thank you. Uh, so, if we, um, so my the second part, in the second part of the presentation, I want to just will focus on the uh, NGSF scenarios. Um, and what you can see here is basically uh, the typical feedback loop um, that you see emerging from uh, when including uh, climate change and climate impacts into uh, your calculation. So, so you have a specific socioeconomic development, uh, that socioeconomic development uh, drives uh, energy demand and land use demand, food demand, which uh, leads to uh, production of energy and food. It has consequences for greenhouse gas emissions. It accumulates in the atmosphere and leads to climate change. Those biophysical changes of the climate, like precipitation changes, droughts, uh, but, uh, but also other changes, have an impact. Um, impact have an, 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 uh, those climate impacts are observed, and the climate impacts then have a feedback on the socioeconomic. Um, development itself. Um, there are two important categories of risks here. On the one hand, uh, there is the uh, physical risk, so trying to understand how big are uh, the climate impacts and how big is the physical risks of, for uh, the economy, different sectors, but also the assets. And then the other risk here is, of course, the transition risk, because by introducing climate policy, uh, one is um, also initiating fundamental uh, transform uh, trans uh, transformations in different sectors uh, that can have adverse uh, uh, side effects. And um, the, the aim, the main objective of the scenarios that um, a number of different indicated assessment teams have developed uh, uh, for and with the NGFS uh, was to try to understand okay those different um, the physical as well as the uh, the transition risks. I think to this group I don't need to uh, introduce the NGFS, but it is the network of greening the financial system, um, and basically bringing together uh, different central banks and supervisors, and we had the pleasure to collaborate. Um, uh, uh, with them as part of a, of a working group and to, de uh, to develop NGFS scenarios. With we, I mean the Potsdam Institute of Climate Change, our institute, the ASA Climate Analytics in Berlin, and the University of Maryland. The project was uh, generously funded by Bloomberg uh, Philanthropics and by Climate Works. Um, I was personally only involved on the sidelines. So I think the main people at the ASA are uh, Bas van Ruiven. Um, uh, and uh, Ji Hun Min, in, 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 you know, who are both in my group, but uh, who were spearheading basically the effort uh, from the from the from the EASA side and the contribution. So I should I would, I would like to really acknowledge them because I think all the good work that she now comes mainly from them and not and not from me. Um, so the objective and the framework of the NGFS scenarios are to explore uh, transition and, um, and the physical risks that I mentioned before. And for this, the framework has been established that uh, basically tries to look in orderly and disorderly transitions um, and uh, in terms of distinguishing between the different transition risks. Obviously, if you respond uh, in a transition in a more orderly way, the risks the transition risks are relatively smaller than if you have a disorderly transition. So this is the this is the uh, vertical axis here of the scenario space. 
And then there is an horizontal axis in the scenario space, which describes different types of physical risks and the extent of physical risks that are there uh, when you meet uh, the climate targets, or how big are the physical risks if you don't meet them. And of course, there is a disorderly or an orderly response to the physical risks pos are possible as well. And depending on how one responds to those risks, economic implications uh, can be very uh, different. So all in all, um, the three different, uh, the, uh, yeah, the three different um, uh, modeling groups and one group who focused on the physical risks um, have developed eight different scenarios and identified three so-called representative scenarios that are representative of an orderly or disorderly transition. Um, and then uh, there is one contrasting representative scenario, which is called the so-called hot house world, where we have limited action in terms of climate policy, uh, so significant needs to respond to the physical risks of uh, relatively higher climate change. The main uncertainties that are um, basically explored in this project are, at the one hand, uh, that we use alternative scenarios again, uh, but we use again also multiple models uh, representing those different alternative scenarios, so very similar to the SSD framework that I mentioned before. Um, so the three representative scenarios uh, are um, situated in this uh, physical and transformation risk space in these three different corners here. Obviously, the hot house world is the world that we have uh, where we don't meet the climate targets. Uh, but have a relatively orderly response uh, to physical risks that occur at temperature changes of about uh, three degrees. Um, and then we have two different um, central representative um, mitigation scenarios, if you wish, if you try to reach uh, two degrees um, with a high likelihood of uh, 6 to 7% chance, with that the likelihood in terms of the uncertainties of the uh, climate systems, um, and then we look into uh, a, a disorderly way to achieve uh, to, uh, to reach the target uh, compared to an uh, to an orderly scenario. And I will come back to how we define disorderly and orderly uh, in a in a second. These are the uh, different emissions pathways that are associated with the three representative scenarios. One, where basically we have no climate policies in addition of those that are in place today, and we look at the temperature response or the greenhouse gas emissions in this case uh, in the future, which leads us somewhere to two degrees. And then we have the orderly scenarios, which, which basically introduces climate policy relatively early um, and, and has a more or less uh, smooth transition path in terms of emissions reductions from today to the future and compare that to, to another pathway, which also tries to get to uh, two degrees with, with high likelihood, uh, but basically delays the emissions reductions in the near term. And because of that delays, if it tries to achieve the same target, needs to have a much more rapid and aggressive uh, reduction pathways after those delays and long term needs also to compensate and be below uh, the smooth transition uh, because uh, cumulative emissions in two scenarios need to be the same. Uh, if you are above the orderly scenario, you need to be below the orderly scenario in the long term. Uh, so you have this very, very rapid reduction pathway here, and what we can see here basically are um, global greenhouse gas emissions, in including all the greenhouse gases, a straight lines, and then the dashed lines are simply the respective CO2 emissions uh, of the same uh, of the same scenarios. Um, then we look into five alternative scenarios. Or alternate scenarios. These scenarios basically uh, explore implications for the results if we include. Uh, more stringent targets, 
or if we assume a different technological availability and different combination of those factors. Um, uh, quickly, perhaps to explain to you um, the alternative scenarios of the light or non light blue here. Um, we uh, basically look into scenarios that also achieve one and a half degrees, so even more stringent scenarios. And uh, this orderly scenario basically is the one here where we limit the contribution of carbon dioxide removal technology. So it's very difficult to get to one and a half degrees if you don't have this option available, which means also transition risk becomes bigger, um, and we compare that to another alternate scenario of one and a half degrees with full CDR available into the future. And this variation is important because CDR technology, while, while it's not a very exotic or very difficult technology from an engineering perspective, it has the major reservations about CDR when it comes to public perception and also uh, at the political level. Um, then there are two um, basically disorderly and orderly scenarios. And here, in addition, a two degree scenario uh, which delays and limits CDR at the same time, uh, and then one uh, orderly scenario, two degrees with full CDR. These are then compared to the main illustrative cases. And on the, in this corner where we have relatively, um, where we don't meet the target, uh, we have added another alternate case. This is the so-called NDC case, so that's the National Determined Contributions. Basically, we have two pathways in this corner. One, the hot house world. Only today's policies are, 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 are introduced. And then if we move to the NDC pathways, basically, uh, we look into the long-term consequences if all the countries fulfill their NDC pledges at the moment. Remember, I showed earlier that these NTC pledges by no means add up to um, meeting the Paris Agreement long term objective of limiting temperature to two or to one and a half degrees. Yeah, what are the assumptions behind these scenarios? So all these scenarios assume intermediate economic growth assumptions of SSP2. Um, shown here in the middle panel, and they also assume intermediate assumptions about uh, population and demographic changes. Basically, population reaches something like 9 billion and then stabilizes. Economic growth assumptions in the long term are around 2% uh, in power purchasing parity globally, and uh, we have a tripling of the economy. So that's more or less in the middle of these scenarios that I showed, showed before. Um, and, and here's some illustration about uh, what, what are the key changes now in terms of the policy action and the technological change developments across the different NGSF scenarios. Um, please focus again on the middle panel. In the middle panel, you can see the uh, emissions price development, the carbon price development of the different scenarios. Uh, obviously, the hot house scenario doesn't have any carbon price because it's just an extrapolation of current policies. And then the orderly transition uh, scenario um, basically uh, ha shows this type of trajectory in terms of carbon prices, where the disorderly scenario waits until 2030, so there is a there is delayed action, but then needs to over proportionally increase the carbon prices in order to achieve the same target. And these are real model results. Um, and as you can, I think it's uh, it, it's uh, nicely visible here um, that uh, basically uh, delaying the carbon price signal as well as the low levels early on needs to be overcompensated later by relatively high carbon prices. In this model, modeling framework, basically, this orderly scenario achieves $700 per ton of carbon, a carbon price, um, compared to $300 of an orderly transition. And um, the price here doesn't mean that these scenarios assume only carbon prices as a policy. The price is a proxy for the effort that is needed and the difference in the effort at the, at the margin uh, when, you, when you reduce the emissions. Uh, we ran these scenarios, of course, with all three different integrated assessment frameworks that were part of the project. And the right hand here shows you basically the variation across the different models for the orderly scenario. 
So this trajectory basically corresponds to this green trajectory here, but you can see the other two models uh, what they project in terms of the carbon price development of the orderly transition. And what's not shown here is the disorderly one, which will also, of course, differ, differ across those different scenarios. Yeah, so the different, uh, the other difference in the scenarios, uh, particularly if you think about the alternate scenarios, is uh, the uh, assumptions about carbon dioxide removal. Um, the extent to which uh, future societies will depend on this technology really affects um, the, the pace of the transition in all different sectors. If the technology doesn't become available, we simply need to reduce emissions much more quickly um, in, the, in the near term. Um, and you can see here basically the difference of assumptions in the two different orderly scenarios. So one orderly scenario that uh, basically allows GHG emissions reduction than another one uh, which basically doesn't allow massive CDR deployment. CDR deployment is still there but at a much lower 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 level. And as you can see basically in 2004 CDR we are significantly below uh, below uh, below the other scenarios. So if you don't have the possibility of negative emissions in the long term this will affect particularly the next two decades, which is, I think, particularly also important from the perspective of, uh, of uh, transition and finance risks. Um, but there is, you see the corresponding um, basically negative emissions in the orderly scenario and the orderly scenario is limited CDR on the right hand side here. I think another important um, um, characteristic, a difference of characteristic in these two scenarios is that a path like this would continue to rely on these technologies and increase their contribution massively the further you go into the future. So you have really heavy reliance on that option. And if that option doesn't turn out to be feasible, the transition path will not be feasible. While this other pathway uses CDR, uh, carbon dioxide removal, more as a transition technology. So you scale that technology up relatively quickly, and then you basically continue to phase it out in the long term. So it's basically supporting the transformation towards renewables and other important non-CDR options. Economic impacts at a glance from the uh, scenarios. Uh, Left-hand side, you can see the transition is basically the, the GDP impacts from the transition risks on the right hand side estimates of the cumulative GDP impact from uh, physical risks. Um, I think you can see quite nicely that the orderly transition um, has say, some upfront investment necessary. So the GDP impact in 2030 from the orderly transition is bigger than from the disorderly. But then because of the delay, we see some escalation of GDP losses in a disorderly scenario by 2050 and by 2000, even beyond 2050, while the orderly scenario can keep the GDP losses at relatively low levels, around 2% compared to around 6%. This is quite a big difference um, in terms of GDP losses that we can expect from different um, mitigation scenarios. At the right hand side, you can see. Um, the uh, GDP impacts uh, from the hothouse world. Uh, generally, they are within the range of 25% um, uh, GDP losses, which is a very high number compared to the reference case. And also in 2050, 10% um, um, uh, or below, uh, which um, uh, can be compared, uh, but only with strong caveats. Uh, to the to the to the to the to the mitigation uh, costs here. So let me make a few caveats about the economic impacts. Um, first of all, um, I think uh, the uncertainty of those economic impacts cannot be um, uh, overstated. There are in the long term there are definitely unknowns unknowns about um, technological innovations that we might not um, understand yet. And in the near term, I think it's important to, to, to understand that the integrated assessment models do not have um, uh, financial markets included. Uh, so monetary and fiscal policy is not represented. Uh, also credit, credit supply and asset 
quality returns from financial institutions as financial markets are not represented. So generally, um, um, developments like we saw it um, from the economic crisis in 2008 and implication of that crisis for future economic growth are not represented in the integrated assessment models. Um, I think that's really important uh, because of the more aggregated economic, overall economic representation. So I think uh, that's an important caveat number one. And then caveat number two is that so far the impacts on the physical risk have been calculated based on relatively simple methodologies. Uh, this project was going on for roughly around six months. So uh, we wanted to get a, a first indicative, we wanted to get first indicative results uh, finished. Um, basically what has been happening here was that we calculated based on different damage functions in the literature uh, from the DICE model, from the Stern model, and then also from the model included in page. Uh, um, uh, no, from, uh, from DICE to Stern and um, uh, what's his name? Oh God, it cannot read, cannot read it here. I'm very bad in names, but three different uh, three different um, damage functions were used here, which come from a very different perspective. And as you can see here, the choice of the damage function is really important for the outcome of the result. But more importantly, I think none of these damage functions actually include really the full physical risk. So um, tipping points. Um, uh, and basically highly non-linear extreme events um, like extreme droughts or floods are not uh, accounted in this uh, in these damage functions yet. But still uh, the difference between the damage functions is particularly the persistence of some of the more gradual impacts. And as you can see, if you add persistence, uh, you can get uh, to, uh, you, you get to much, much higher uh, damages. Um, than if you don't include it. And the other big difference between the, these damage functions, uh, no, not the difference, actually the other factor that you can see in the figures quite nicely, um, hot house world, orderly transition, disorderly transition, the gray areas are actually the uncertainty of the climate system itself. Um, so it's not necessarily the climate system which makes this different, the uncertainty of it, it's really the damage function which creates very different economic outlooks. Um, so what we want to do, hence, is in the phase two of the project to much more, um, uh, much better include biophysical impacts and um, physical risks bottom up, include basically heat waves, cyclones, uh, sea level rise, which are which is long term far beyond the horizon of these models, but. Uh, but will have uh, economic impacts as well uh, into the calculations, and um, this is going to happen in phase two. Perhaps a few other um, uh, comments on future development here that uh, uh, the plan is to expand the scenario and the modeling um, to explore further dimensions of risks, uh, to improve the regional coverage, uh, and to calculate particularly probabilistic losses uh, once we. Uh, have added also uh, the frequency and probability of the extreme events uh, better into the uh, calculations. And we want to also further improve uh, the, the NGFS scenario database and explorer. There's a portal actually where all the information is also publicly available and that you can visit. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very abrupt end of my presentation. Yeah, but, uh, it is very abrupt, but um, and you leave us with a lot of thinking, uh, which of course makes it not easy now for me to uh, to uh, introduce into the discussion. Um, let me just say, I mean, so far from both of your presentations, we have very little heard about um, about the concerns. Macroeconomic uh, or macroeconomists in, in, in central banks usually have that are rather short to midterm concerns. When we talk about midterm, then we think of a three to perhaps five year uh, span or, or, or rather, rather less. 
And, and then we already think we, we, are, we are thinking much more already into the future than uh, usually economic policy actors would. Uh, in fiscal, uh, I mean, the fiscal side, finance ministries would, would, would think basically over the time span of one year or a bit more. And financial markets think basically in terms of quarters. So we, but we, but you both are thinking generally in terms of the next uh, centuries, and uh, it is of course interesting to know how this knowledge of the next centuries might interfere in our rather short to midterm thinking, yeah? and that's of course uh, what what we are basically interested in. Uh, I mean, to give it just one hint, for example, I mean all these risks which can be derived from your interesting scenarios, they may enter already in the very short term. And to some extent, they already do possibly. Uh, I just remember last year, for example, the, the Rhine, the, the, the river in, um, went through Germany with a very low uh, water level, which meant that for a couple of weeks, at least, uh, the, the shipping had to be stopped. And this had uh, led to a a, a, a noticeable, uh, significant uh, GDP reduction in, 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 in Germany over at least this uh, this quarter. Um, so these these are increasingly impacting our 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 uh, consideration. But perhaps you have a better way to 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 link these two worlds perhaps in, in words. Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's a very important uh, uh, the very that's a very important observation. That they're basically horses for courses, right? So, so I think um, for really looking into the next um, uh, five uh, to 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 ten years, uh, they need to couple different approaches to each other. I think. Um, that's that's actually something that is that's 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 started in the community to try to uh, bring some um, financial sector models that uh, can help you with the evaluation of the finance risk and translate integrated assessment model results into a real uh, a real risks and 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 really we are able to depict what the dynamics that are important in the short term. Um, I think what you need for that is uh, what, what I was uh, referring to earlier. So you need more information about um, some of the extreme, um, some of the some of the extreme events, the frequency of some of those events, like for example, what happened with the rain or droughts in the in the in the in the, in the Middle East. Um, they are very difficult to integrate in these long-term models at the, because they have they happen at the sub-annual scale. So you need to couple more or less models with sub-annual scales to these more long-term um, long-term tools. I think it's possible, and we, and we need to do it. We do it already on the on the national and the sub-national scale. For example, I'm involved a lot uh, on work uh, with uh, for the Indian government. Um, so we um, have provided the, the, the modeling framework for Niti Aayog, which is uh, working directly under the cabinet office of Modi for their energy planning um, needs. They needed also tools that are much more relevant in the short term. And on that national and that national and province scale, it's of course possible to integrate much more detail, and you have also much more information that you can integrate than a tool which has to operate at the global scale, where the heterogeneity of the underlying, just think about the underlying markets and and policies in each country, you you, really, you, you would really need to, to 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 represent all of those at the global level. I think that's that's probably not so useful. To try to do this because, uh, but but working on the national level with national experts and try to translate those global scenarios for the local scale, I think is is, is a very promising way to go scientifically. Yeah, thank you for this short response. 
Um, maybe, yeah, maybe I have two more technical questions. Um, because you, you showed us that some uh, simulations end up in the year 2100 with a lower GDP by 4% up to 25%. This is basically all the numbers of the different scenarios. But if you uh, apply a relative standard discount rate, especially to the minus 4% scenario, then basically the economic valuation uh, would tell you that you should not bother at all. And then, so do you, uh, do you apply different discount rates when you uh, run your simulations? And then, uh, are these important ingredients of your simulations and the scenarios? Or do these effects cancel out somehow? And then, the second question is that um, I think it's, it's Harvard's Richard Seckhauser has been advocating for some time now uh, something called solar geoengineering as a technology to dampen the effect of global warming. And I just wonder whether that kind of technologies are somehow a part of your simulations or not. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me perhaps ask your second, uh, answer your second question first. So, uh, solar radiation management, so the traditional uh, approaches like, for example, spraying sulfur in the stratosphere or trying to put shields into the atmosphere or into the orbit uh, to shade the planet are uh, generally not part of uh, integrated assessment models. So these are these traditional geoengineering approaches. But what uh, is part of the system is our approaches that try to reduce the carbon from the, from the atmosphere. Like for example, using biomass in, com in combination with electricity production, and then a carbon capture and storage, even using it together with liquid fuels, a massive forest management um, 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 programs that would enhance the biophysical, uh, biospheric um, sink is included. Um, there are also a number of other options not, not included in all of the scenarios. For example, you can store lots of CO2 in different types of uh, materials and feedstocks. Um, you can enhance the carbon soil uh, by uh, the, the soil content or, or the carbon content of the soil by, um, for example, um, uh, yeah, by, by including peat into it, for example. Uh, iron fertilization is possible. Iron fertilization is not included. So there's a whole portfolio of options. Some are included, some are not included. Uh, but specifically, solar radiation management options are not included. Uh, and I think what you need to do, is, and the reason for that is also, I would rather include that, first of all, in, uh, in the climate models to try to understand the climatic implications of those uh, rather than in the, into the mitigation models, into the integrated assessment models. Because we can generate quite some climate impacts to those type of measures as well that you want to understand first before you perhaps include it in the, in the economic analysis. Um, with respect to discounting, um, um, that's a good point. So generally, that's a very important point. Uh, generally, um, uh, there are modeling frameworks where discounting is more an endogenous factor, and those which have ex exogenous the discounting is an exogenous input. Um, in our modeling framework, for example, we have a discounting of 4% per year included, uh, but we generally, when we have scientific publications, we vary the discount rate to show very clearly that um, the uh, timing of mitigation uh, really depends on uh, on the assumed discount rate. Um, so the, the bigger the discount rate, the, 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 the more you discount the way long-term impacts and um, um, the, 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 the more the model tries to wait before it reduces emissions, obviously. Um, so pushes basically all the costs into the future. Uh, we were running here the scenarios in the cost-effectiveness cost approach. So there was no cost-benefit analysis that a discount rate is even more important. So, so for these scenarios, different discount rates basically 
audited the timing to achieve the same target. At the end, you need to reduce emissions to zero and you need to stay between the, within the remaining carbon budget. And I would say at very stringent, um, at very stringent levels like one and a half degrees, um, to play with the CDR, with carbon dioxide removal, because it's the only way to push emissions reductions into the future, uh, is like also playing with this country. So it's basically synonymous if you do a cost effectiveness approach. Um, um, but, uh, but I think it's a good comment. Perhaps we should even in the next phase of uh, of these scenarios uh, consider different discount rates. I will communicate this to my colleagues who are involved in this. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I see also a comment actually in the chat box. Uh, to this one, I think it's arbitrary and increasing unrealistic to achieve at the same time. And another same subject and normal level of uncertainty. Yeah, I think that's really important too that I, that I, that I, uh, how strong is the lukewarm as opposition? <laughs> I like the day how it is phrased. So, um, so I have to say, um, so the, the, the obviously the, the both targets, the two degree target as well as the one and a half degree target, has been uh, informed by science, but has been uh, established and determined in international negotiations, and uh, by, is, is, it comes from the political side. At the same time, if we look into the difference in terms of impact of a two degree scenario and the one and a half degree scenario, um, we are here in a highly nonlinear space. So if, we, if, if one looks, for example, into uh, the results for multi-sectoral extremes and hotspots, which includes uh, uh, water, um, land, um, as well as um, uh, heat-related um, uh, and energy-related impacts. And if you just look at the fraction of people that will be exposed at multi-sectoral extremes, uh, you double the people in a two-degree scenario compared to the one-and-a-half-degree scenario. And the difference are hundreds of millions of people also who at the moment live below uh, the poverty line. And we're talking about near-term effects in 2050 now. Uh, so there is a pronounced and very big difference in terms of the impact side between one and a half degrees and, and, and two degrees. So the physical risk is really different. Uh, so, they, so, so selecting one and a half degree over two degrees is not arbitrary from the impact side. And I can perhaps send you at one or two papers who, who show that I think very um, uh, very um, in, a, in, a, in a nicely accessible and illustrative way. Um, uh, from the mitigation side, on the other side, they, they make a very big difference too, because uh, for the for the near term, um, the, the economic losses as well as the carbon price difference between one and a half degree scenarios and two degree scenarios are also um, are also so also very big. So so I would say there is. Very little arbitrariness in this um, in the in the one and a half degree scenario, without real um, political and system changes. I agree, it's increasingly unrealistic. But it's not increasingly unrealistic because we cannot introduce those changes, or because those changes would crash the economy. It's increasingly unrealistic because of the lack of political will and attention uh, to the to the problem. I think that that has always to be communicated as well. So what, are the, what is the underlying assumption that makes the target unrealistic? Is it because we don't have the technologies, because the technologies are too expensive? Um, I would not agree to that. In many parts of the world, solar has become so cheap that it's the cheapest form of energy at the moment. And so the main question is, how do we store energy to, to, to overcome the intermittency of solar? And there we have a fundamental change in costs over the last five years, which continues at the moment as well. Um, so sorry for this lengthy answer, but I think it's really important to, to understand uh, the difference on the impact side between one and a half degrees and two degrees, and also what makes the target unrealistic. Um, okay, I stop here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, also for keeping indeed the time and helping to to finish at the almost perfect uh, uh, point of time right now, 
just 10 minute, minutes after 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 our planned uh, uh, hour, uh, we uh, have suggested this, a couple of uh, of videos already on the on the initial uh, invitation for this summer school. One was the um, for today I proposed the uh, laureate speech of um, of uh, Nordhaus when he received the the Nobel laureate, uh, which is very interesting. It introduces indeed this uh, I am uh, uh, models and distinguishes between the the, 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 the major ones. And uh, also Steve Keen, who criticizes uh, this approach. Um, we have already talked a bit on this. Of course, both are you are, you are a bit skeptical, positive on both sides, uh, with good reasons. I I I understand, but nevertheless, uh, it is interesting to have these these very different views and to make your own thinking on on it. Um, yeah, I think. That's for today. Thank you very much for giving us so much insight into your uh, thinking, into your work. Uh, we would also hope to get you a slide to be able to spread them if you if you if you uh, like. And uh, we hope we continue our cooperation in other more practical areas in the in the future, even here in Austria, where we apparently all sit together, and it should be much easier to cooperate than we already do. So thank you very much for being with us and yeah, see you soon. Thank you to everybody else and tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock we will continue. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.